welcome everybody, uh, city council members and uh, individuals that are in the audience uh, to our regular scheduled city council meeting. Today is Tuesday, May 19th, 2015, and it is 6 p.m. and I do call this meeting to order. And as always at the uh, second meeting in, uh, of the month, we have the youth of the month and we have uh, teacher Ron Steinhorst <coughs> is here tonight. Come on up, Ron, and uh, if you would, bring your students with you, too. Um. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight. The first item on the agenda, I would like to move the resolution to bring back summer. <laughs> we have a second, have a second to the motion. First of all, you stand in front of me, and now you take over my meeting. <laughs> well, I just learned all this good experience from the new London Council, you know, where I've been there for six years. So, And I want you to know that our last packet was 16 pages. Thank you, Ron. Uh, <laughs> And about 47 minutes. So uh, not much going on in New London. No, no, <laughs> it, it's a dead spot for sure. Uh, thank you. This is an opportunity to uh, certainly showcase some of the students that you have here at Wapaka High School. Uh, I did teach at New London for 44 years, English and speech, and then retired. And then Mrs. Luce asked me to come over and uh, assist her. And so this is now my sixth year that I've been working with the students here. And uh, certainly you need to be very, very proud, number one, of a fantastic student body, a fantastic s uh, school, a fantastic administration, and the support that you have not only from the parents, and boy, they've been in and helping us uh, a lot throughout in terms of fundraising, our tournaments, and so on and so forth, and uh, just uh, the real behind the people wheels, if you will. So uh, be proud. In case you haven't thought about that, again, be proud uh, of your school system here. Uh, I've been working primarily within the world of forensics. Uh, we're not dealing with body parts at this particular point. Uh, we're dealing more with the activity of speech and speech communication. And this deals all the way from original works that students write themselves and present to the uh, interpretive events where they are in reading and or interpreting what someone else has necessarily written. The advantage basically is that, number one, it gives them some lifetime skills. It's not as though they're going to be hobbling around with two broken knees or something of that sort. No offense, sports people. Uh, but this is definitely a lifetime skill. And I have students right now, former students of mine who have uh, are working in Washington, D.C. as speech writers uh, who are working in the FBI in Alaska, Washington, and Oregon, uh, basically spread throughout the entire country. I have the head oncology doctor in Milwaukee, who was one of my former orators at one particular time. So it opens a wide, wide world, really, of where they might want to go and what they might want to necessarily do. Uh, as I said, it, it's a skill that is going to take them places that uh, the normal student probably will not get. And for your information, many of the colleges today and universities are looking for not so much the GPA, the grade point average, as they're looking for those students who've been involved in the skills of speech and communication uh, and debate those kinds of activities because they are the ones who really are able to open up the world to uh, other individuals along the way. 
But enough of my blabbering, and uh, let me introduce to you uh, the individuals that we have here. Uh, I'm going to start on my left. Uh, first of all, you're looking at Cole Pankratz. Uh, Cole has been active all four years. He's earned the highest degree from the National Speech and Debate Communication, which is the degree of premier outstanding honor. Uh, he is at almost the top of his class with just a 3.99 grade point average. I don't know where he screwed up along the way, but uh, I, I would assume it must have been a home ec or something of that sort, probably. Uh, Cole will be, and most of these students will be traveling, uh, leaving Thursday morning for Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, for the National Catholic Forensic League Tournament. So they will be in competition. They have all qualified uh, in that light. Cole will be, actually, he triple qualified in student congress, so he could very well take over for you here. Uh, he, <laughs> not that I'm saying you can't, okay. Uh, he qualified in oral interpretation, which is prose and poetry, and also in original oratory, and that is the event that he's going to be uh, speaking on, on anger control. Next here we have Ryan, uh, thank you, Ryan Wisey. I uh, don't get there, okay. Uh, Ryan is co-partnered with Kelsey Wolfgram. Uh, he and Kelsey are doing a duo interpretation, uh, which is entitled Countdown to Love. And the two of them working together, they may not look at each other, uh, they may not touch each other, but they have to coordinate and actually be themselves, so they're almost as a, a, a twosome functioning as a single individual. Ryan is one of our four-point students here at uh, Wapaka High School. Uh, that was until this semester came along. This semester will also be a four-point, I hope. Good. Okay. Well, you know, we don't want you to get down too fast, too quick, or something of that sort. So again, praises to uh, Ryan. To my immediate uh, right, we have Emily Cummings. Uh, I'm sorry, Nicole Weisey, the partners here. Uh, Nikki is the sister of Ryan and uh, has just came from track practice. I was supposed to keep my nose away, but that's okay. Uh, uh, she is also involved, along with Emily, in duo interpretation, and they're doing the work Steel Magnolias. Uh, that's a rather complicated scene because they're actually dealing with three different scenes and melding them together as one. Uh, next we have Christian Bump. Uh, Christian is in oral interpretation. He's doing two selections. One of them, a poetry selection entitled How to Watch Your Brother Die, and a prose selection entitled Almost Normal. Uh, so he will be actually reading from a manuscript and uh, doing that interpretation from the author's point of view. Uh, next to that, as I mentioned already, we do have Emily Cummings. Uh, Emily is a senior this year. Emily is the uh, partner here to Nikki and uh, has a 3.99 or 3.98. No, it's up there somewhere, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, you're seeing some of the creme de la creme, if you will, uh, that we have here at uh, Wapaka High School. Next we have Ryan Phillipson. Uh, Ryan is one of our sophomores this year, correct? Uh, and uh, although Ryan is not going on to the national tournament, uh, he was the winner at our Wapaka tournament in terms of what we call um, the double quad, um, what do we call it, the double, crown. double crown, thank you. Uh, double crown basically says he had to be involved in two events and he placed the highest of all of the students that were at the tournament in that particular event. So uh, that's certainly a prestigious honor. Uh, to his um, right, I always have to stop and think, because left and right to me is this way, this way, and I get lost standing still. So they're going to have to keep me straight there in Florida. Uh, we have Emily uh, Meyer. 
Emily is also a sophomore. She is involved also in original oratory. Uh, her goal this year is to convince their entire audience to forget about all the regrets that you've ever had in life. To regret, regret. It's a rather interesting, different type of topic, but perhaps one that will shine because it is different. And certainly last but not least over there at the far end we have uh, Tom Phillipson. Thomas is a senior. Thomas is also involved in duo interpretation. We have a lot of interp people. Well, Pack, and I think part of that is the arts of the community really bring out the arts that are in our students themselves. And again, I think we have to commend the whole community and your community theater and so on uh, for supporting those arts along the way. So he is performing uh, Jerry Finnegan's sister along with his partner, Kelsey Wolfgram. What's that? I'm sorry, yes. You have Kelsey. I, I can't keep all these kids straight. You know, We started out with 68 of them, so you know, it, was, it was a little bit hectic, yes. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Thomas. You know, I'm, that's the way it goes when you get old. You, know, you forget a few things here and there. Uh, yes, he is working with McKenna Mesa and Jerry Finnegan's uh, sister. So these are the students, most of whom will be leaving uh, Thursday morning early. Uh, for Fort Lauderdale, and uh, I again, I want you to uh, give them a round of applause for the wonderful work that they have done. The fact that these are going to be the people that will in one day be sitting in the chairs behind me. That's assuming, of course, they stay in Wapaka. And we have some certificates of recognition. Uh, this is certified, this one to Emily Cumming, Cummings for Outstanding Youth of the Month Award. Uh, Emily? And then to Nicole Wisey. And to Brian Wisey. And to Christian Bonk. And Ryan Phillipson. Thomas Phillipson, Nicole Pancras, Dakota Marlega was not able to be with us this evening, so uh, with your permission I will present that to her Thank you. when I see her, and Emily Meyer. And at this point then you would like us to lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance? Please. Correct? Everyone so please rise, face the flag here. Whenever you're ready. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Congratulations. I gotta get that microphone away from him. <laughs> okay, as we continue, uh, I know we got the coloring contest coming up very shortly, but let us get through a couple of items here and then we'll get to that. Uh, Sandy, if you would, uh, would you read the clerk's open meeting statement for us? This meeting and all other meetings of the Common Council are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the press <coughs> in accordance with Wisconsin state statutes, so the citizens may be aware of the time, place, and agenda of this meeting. Thank you, and would you also take roll for us? Brian Smith? Here. Steve Hackett? Here. Paul Hagen? Here. Alan Keeland? Here. Scott Prochatsky? Here. Dave Peterson? Here. Paul Mayo? Here. Chuck Whitman? Here. Jillian Peterson? Here. And Eric Olson? Here. Nine present, we have a quorum. Thanks, Andy. Uh, consent agenda. These are items that we're going to take one motion on in one second and vote on those with that one motion. Uh, Sandy has one uh, 
item that she handed out tonight? Under number six, consent agenda, letter D, number one, the Parks and Recreation minutes of a regular meeting on May 14th, 2015 were distributed. Thank you. Is there any items that uh, council would like to see move from the consent agenda to the regular agenda? If not, uh, we'll need a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion by Keela and second by Hagen that we approve the consent agenda with that one addition. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Regular agenda, uh, these are items that we'll take uh, individually. Uh, Sandy, you did have some handouts there also? Or you didn't? Well, it was emailed earlier, the okay. sewer service charge. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And Sandy put uh, that on your desk as well as it was emailed to you. Anything else, uh, Council? If not, again, we're looking for a motion to approve the regular agenda. So moved. Second. Motion by Hackett, second by Jillian Peterson, that we approve the regular agenda. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, let's uh, move on then to what we're all been waiting for here, the winners of the National Public Works Coloring Contest. And Henry is going to uh, help me in, in handing these out. So we have the following individuals. If you want to just come out in front here, it's uh, Braden Harris, Benji Becker, Tiana Miller, Braden Stern. Uh, Carter Fermanick is ill today, won't be here. Uh, Maya, sorry, Wa Walla. <laughs> there we go, Walzinski. <laughs> Haley McClellan and Connor Taggart. How you guys doing? Can you hear me now? Thanks. As the mayor said, uh, we're at the point of the agenda that everybody's been waiting for. Um, this is like becoming a tradition, the coloring contest. I believe this is the 19th year of us doing it. Um, and uh, we appreciate all you guys' interest in the event. Um, we have two, four, eight winners to present. One is absent, as the mayor said. Braden, where are you? Braden, can you show us your picture, please? Very good. Braden is with uh, Mrs. Anderson's class at the Wapaka Learning Center. You can come over here and then we'll show the next one. Our next win winner is Benji Becker. Benji, can you show us uh, yours? Very good. Thank you. And Tyona Miller? Tyona? Okay, Tyona is with Mrs. Seifert's class at the WLC. Braden Stern, can you show us yours? Very good, thanks Braden. Braden is in Mrs. DeRay's class in the Learning Center. Carter Fermanish, Carter? Oh, okay, sorry, miss. Uh, he's in Mrs. Hankey's class. Maya Wolinitsky? <laughs> you know what? You can spell your name in first grade. You're doing great. Can you show us your... Awesome. Thank you. Girls in Public Works. It's great. We need more of you. Um, Haley McClellan. Haley, show us your picture, please. Haley's at the chain school. Great. Thank you. And then Connor, show us yours. Very good. Thank you. Can we give these guys a big round of applause? Now, you saw all the students of the month, right? Those were big kids, right? Big students? Well, you're getting something more than a certificate. You're getting a gift certificate to the Dairy Queen, so for your winning. Now, Mayor, help me out. John has that all up there. Thank you. So, <laughs> so you can uh, 
take your brothers out or your mom and dad for a bite to eat or something, but uh, uh, we really appreciate your interest. Now, what we've done, I believe in the past, we have displayed these up in the lobby of the, of the city hall, and we'll do that for the whole year. So when you bring your buddies in or your friends, you can point to your picture, your coloring contest winner. So we really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, on to the nitty-gritty of the evening here. Uh, we have, uh, under announcement still, we have a thank you note from Ann Linden. Uh, she's with the Wolfpack Book Fest. That's just for your information only. Uh, next, we have public input. Uh, public input is uh, set aside for a citizen that would like to speak to the city council on a non-agenda item. If there's anybody in the audience or even a council member that would like to speak to us on an item that is not on our agenda tonight, uh, please give your name and address. Step up to the podium, give your name and address for the record. Uh, seeing none and hearing none, we'll move on to department announcements and reports. Um, as always, again, at our second meeting of the month, we do uh, like to hear from our department heads and Tell us what's going on in the city. So, Kathy, we'll start with you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, according to my report that I've put in the packet, uh, worse, uh, the department is assisting the community, community development department in evaluating um, development within the TIDS and also with um, reviewing the status of the TIDS uh, for a future presentation to the council. Uh, we are reviewing as you can see from tonight's agenda, um, the financial policies and making recommendations to update the municipal code. And I'm also working with a PMA Financial Network on a project to develop a cash flow report for the city. Uh, I've worked with PMA in my former municipality and they've agreed to use their intern uh, in their office to develop the reports that are for us for at no charge. So um, I will have samples of the reports uh, in the June packet for everyone. Otherwise, I don't have anything else. All right. Thanks, Kathy. I, I know you're going to have a few items later in the packet. Uh, Peg, library. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Um, well, the library board did adop adopt the strategic plan that was created with Connie Albert's help. And we have three new youth on board that are going to help us get started with this. And our next step is then to create goals and objectives to help it meet the needs of our community. We do have a program, Square Foot Gardening, at <coughs> noon on Friday. And it is a lunch and learn. You just need to make reservations, come for lunch and for the program. Baby Garden is still on on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. But all other children's programs are taking a break until we start our big summer library program next month. Um, our theme for the year is every hero has a story and so we're really talking about those people who show um, great courage or, or have heroic acts and we're um, really talking about the idea that there's a hero in all of us. Um, our altered book exhibit is through Friday and um, we will be closed Saturday and Monday for the holiday. Our seed library is open and available so if anybody needs seeds for their garden um, you can stop on by. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Peg. Uh, development Director Brennan. 
Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. My report's in the packet. Um, our department is getting relatively busy now. They're, we're definitely seeing an uptick in some of the development and construction that's occurring, whether it's home remodels or uh, new c commercial projects um, or additions to homes. So there's definitely an uptick in that. Also with the spring or spring season, minus today's winter weather, uh, we're definitely seeing an uh, increase in more co-enforcement complaints coming in for grass cutting and as the snow melted, more stuff out on people's lawns. So we're starting to take care of that. Finishing up the last of the grants for the Main Street project that's due uh, next week, submitting that uh, for the Community Development Block Grant. And with that comes uh, a plethora of requests for proposals and qualifications that staff would be bringing forward to you guys within the next month here. Currently working on one for the Main Street uh, Master Plan, Downtown Parking Utilization Study. We'll also be looking at one probably within the next couple of months in conjunction with working with the finance department, um, our marketing plan that we're looking at for the TIDs, so that'll be coming forward. Also working on a code enforcement um, position um, change that'll be coming forward to you guys probably in the next quarter. That's all I have. Thanks, Brennan. Uh, next, uh, Roger, you got? Yeah, good. Thank you. Roger is... Uh, Stepping in, obviously, for our vacant uh, public works director, and he's going to give us a report from uh, each one of the supervisors that uh, make up the public works department. Raj? Well, we finished uh, West Fulton Street paving um, last Wednesday. Uh, the marking went down on Friday and reopened. We are doing some uh, uh, thermoplastic crosswalk stop bar onlys and arrows that we're putting down ourselves. We're working on them uh, now. Uh, the Hillcrest project is going to be starting this week some, uh, putting in some catch basin boxes and doing a little two service repairs and um, removing one manhole and putting a valve box in for the water department. Uh, we repaved the end of uh, Water Street here last Friday, smoothed that up. The water department repaired two uh, services uh, that were leaking, one on Royalton, one on Jefferson Street. And uh, the wall the wastewater treatment plant um, did some lift station work and some maintenance on those, and also um, are re roofing the roof at the Crystal River lift station that bed shingles on it, along with all the other various stuff we work on daily. Awesome. Thank you, Roger. I, that Fulton Street is. Getting any compliments on that? Holy cow, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I've gotten a lot, as, as many compliments as I had people, you know, ripping on the street for <laughs> a right. long period of time. So it, it's fantastic. Great job. Yeah. And timely, too. I can't believe how quickly you got it done. That's, that's nice. Uh, next, then, we have Aaron, uh, Parks and Rec Director. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I just want to touch on a few things not in the report. Uh, the Augie Austin gym floor will be done with construction on June 1st uh, or a couple days before. However, the finish that's being applied to it will uh, not allow people to be on it for about 12 days after. That's a little longer period um, than there will be in future years since it's the first year they have to put a couple coats on it. Um, so we're looking at June 12th uh, for full use of that gym. Uh, the mentoring meeting uh, is not in your packet either. That We had a mentoring meeting Last Tuesday, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, we had about 20 people in attendance, um, hoping to get 20 people matched with 20 littles. Um, and we already have six applied. That was before the meeting even started. So I think, I think we'll be on track to meet that. Uh, we're currently looking into recreation software. Uh, the software is called ActiveNet. Uh, just kind of in the beginning stages of it right now. Uh, if we did try to pursue this, this would be done through donor money um, and not through taxpayer money. Rick, uh, our cemetery, Sexton, will be retiring May 29th. Um, so that's coming right up, and we're looking to uh, get work done uh, in various ways in his absence, so we're working through that. But Rick's been with us for about 30 years, um, and he's been a, a great employee, and, and we'll definitely miss his services. Um, we have a movie in the park June 5th. Uh, that's down at South Park, so we're ramping up for that and encourage everyone to put that on their schedule. Achieve is working 
with us on possibly creating or putting out a proposal for a bike and pedestrian plan uh, for the community. Um, that's going to be a little bit of a process, but we're in the beginning stages right now. Uh, and then I think the last time I reported, Terry Moe was still our senior center coordinator, and that is no longer the case. She has accepted another job with Johnson Family Insurance. Her last day was May 7th. Um, Terry has done a great job in the senior center for us. Uh, for about 25 years and um, we are looking to review that job description right now or in the process of it I'll bring something forward on June 2nd um, to pass uh, some minor changes uh, and we'll look to hire hopefully have that position filled mid-July uh, if we're, we feel comfortable with the candidates so and that's all I have Mayor. All right thank you Aaron. Thank you. Chief Koch. Thanks Mayor. Uh, my packet, my monthly report is in your packet. We had our meeting just this evening. We had changed it to accommodate some uh, interview schedules. We're interviewing for the one position police officer. We interviewed three candidates today. We'll be doing background checks and identifying a viable candidate within the next couple of weeks. Uh, one other thing that came in, we had our Culver's Crime Stoppers fundraising a few weeks ago and we netted about $316 in donations which is up from last time and again that money is used for the quick 50 program and for funding and maintaining the online drug tip line budget wise we're at 33 percent of the budget year and we've expended about 30.37 percent uh, the rest is informational all right thank you chief okay and Henry Thanks, Mayor. Uh, my report uh, starts on page 39 of the packet. Uh, a couple of things on the, uh, in the personnel area. We are actively in the recruitment stage for our uh, next director of public works. Uh, the deadline is uh, May 27th, so if you know anyone that might be interested, please encourage them to visit our website uh, and review those materials. And then uh, mid-June will be the kickoff of our uh, job description study, and uh, that'll begin, and it'll, it'll take a number of months to work through that. Um, I did make you aware of a little bit of a, um, a hit to our personal property overall assessments. Uh, <clears throat> now that uh, cable TV is a statewide franchise, they made a, an appeal to the state, and much of their equipment uh, and personal property has been exempted. Uh, for our city, it's, you know, $570,000 uh, off our personal track, uh, personal property tax rolls, and that's probably 20% or 25% of our base. Um, it's not a huge number, you know, maybe $6,000 in lost revenue, but it, you know, you know, it's significant when you look at our overall personal property tax base. And then finally, uh, Brennan and I, um, one of the things that came out of uh, some of the downtown visioning as well as a, a small business forum that he got going was the need to get some more downtown events. And uh, we're working on that. There, there's some chamber uh, representation on our committee as well as some business owners. And we wanted to start small this year, and we've picked two events, uh, one at the end of uh, August, August 27th. It's a putt-putt um, uh, golf uh, tournament <clears throat> and then at the end of September oh excuse me October 1 we're planning a tailgate party and that's the homecoming weekend so we hope to integrate the events and get more activity downtown uh, those events we will be bringing forward official street closures and, and more information um, the homecoming uh, event the tailgate party is alcohol free uh, the uh, golf uh, event, uh, the folks that are involved in this would like to uh, propose uh, the ability for people to walk on the streets with an open container. And, you know, we'd have to define the area. Uh, we are working up an exact, uh, more precise proposal and want to get information from other communities that, that's doing that. But I want to make you aware of it. I'd really appreciate if you have major concerns or want to provide some input to Brennan, myself, uh, Terry, Mitch at the chamber, please do on that concept. I mean, it would be a limited uh, area of the main street, uh, very likely just a, like a two-block area. 
uh, and it would be for a set period of time, you know, while the golf tournament is going on. So it won't be an all-night affair uh, by any means, but it's a big change from our licensing in the past. So um, please uh, seek us out if you have any uh, any comments. And, and I think next month we'll be bringing a, a formal proposal to you. So thank you, Mayor. All right. Thanks, Henry. Aaron, I forgot to ask you a question. Uh, um, in the senior advisory minutes, there was a recommendation on the fees for the seniors to use the senior center. What's the process there? Because I, I, it's not on the council packet. I just, it's right. going to go through your. Uh, they just discussed fees um, and whether to raise them or not. The senior center advisory committee um, had voted. Their recommendation was to not raise them. Um, and actually, that was for a two-year period. Um, it's for a three-year period. Three? Okay. Thank you. Um, and, you know, that can get reevaluated year after year, I think, even if it was a recommendation by that committee. I think we can bring it up. Okay. So you don't plan on doing anything until the budget process on on that discussion with the with the council or with your board we'll probably we'll, we'll look at everything so I'm not okay. saying it's completely off the table but yeah okay all right Can thanks I ask Brennan something sure and this is something silly but uh, I read your report and I had some difficulty and why I had this difficulty because of the RFQ the RFP the CED the CFO the ECWRPC the CED, the TID, the GIS, and the STP. <laughs> um, Brennan, I know you work with these every day, and your report shows it, but I don't work with them every day, and I had a hard time knowing what, I didn't know what everything meant. And I really do like to know what it means. And maybe one time when you do your report, you could at least tell us what each means as you do it the first time, and then we would know for the whole report. I can certainly do that. And then I went to the Peggy's report, and it went S L A G Y A L S A S L P and V I P, and I yes, I know what V I P means. And then I read a little bit further, and it was volunteer and partnership, and I went oh. <laughs> so I really would appreciate you yeah. people saying what it is because I have a hard time when we come with all these. Understood. Go ahead, Dave. I do have a question of Brennan, and just. I drove through King today and I saw the, the shop that had closed and now it's open with a motorcycle repair. Is that not the one from Churchill Street moving out there? I didn't catch the name. I didn't look that close at it, but is that entity that's going to go into the Churchill Street one still planning on doing that? I have not heard of anything. The last communication that we had with them is that they did need state approved plans because they were. Um, changing the use of the building off of Churchill Street, but nothing has actually come through our office at the moment for change of use. I know our building inspector went out there, and we they he met with the the state inspector along with their building contractor, but um, there hasn't been any activity at that site at the moment. Okay. Anybody else have any questions of the department heads at this time? All right, let's move on then to unfinished business or kind of unfinished business here. This is a request by Alderperson Paul Hagan to reinstate the Board of Public Works for an interim, interim period to, until uh, the hiring of a new Director of Public Works. Um, Paul, again, your name is on this, so you want to just start the discussion, please? Sure. Uh, in the absence of a Public Works Director, I thought it would be a, a good idea to reinstate the Board of Public Works to uh, um, have uh, a few more sets of eyes and some uh, some additional input in, into this, into our Public Works while we do not have a, a director. Um, so I wanted to bring up the discussion of possibly uh, bringing back the Public Works Committee uh, at least on a temporary basis until such time that we would get a new Public Works Director and then we would um, relook at that to see if it has benefits. Um, you know, perhaps the new director might appreciate um, having some input while they're getting acclimated to the job. So uh, that's the, the essence of it. 
Uh, any other comments or, Paul, did you want to make a motion or? Um, I mean, I know we did discuss this at the last meeting and I just didn't know if we wanted to have any further discussion before we. I guess the, I guess the, uh, um, what's still up in the air is if this would just be uh, Alderman or if this would still have, if this would have at large input the way uh, you had envisioned it, Mayor. So I think that question needs to be answered first. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Scott. I guess uh, initially I thought the same as Paul, but now my question would be, we have to have a somewhat of a head of this committee, which usually was John, our public <coughs> works director. Now, with everyone wearing part of John's hat, I guess I don't know if it's the proper time to give him another extra burden right now uh, as far as having to hold a meeting. I guess that would be my <coughs> thinking. Now, I like the thought of the committee, but maybe after we do get a public source director, then we can, we actually have a someone there running the meeting. I'm not so sure who would want to do that with all their other duties. So I guess, Paul, I'm kind of thinking a little bit opposite of you as far as the timing. Okay. Anybody else? Council members? Steve, go ahead. I, I, I agree with Paul that I really think um, some of the council people should be in there to help. Uh, everybody else has a committee that has council business except public works. Okay. Dave? I agree more with Scott on the fact that uh, unless you have somebody there that really knows ins and outs of it, the rest of us would just be spinning our wheels in mud, I think, about really great knowledge of behind-the-scenes stuff. There is somebody like that, but I leave a temporary committee's fine with me. But okay. Other comments? Henry, go ahead. Yeah, um, I know. To John's credit, you knew that you saw the last three council meetings of his tenure here. He took on about six months worth of work. Significant uh, uh, issues with. Uh, our sewer use ordinance, the, uh, the mom uh, maintenance uh, manual for our sewer collection system. Uh, we put the, uh, the, uh, those projects together and bid and the equipment were bid. Uh, I, unless I'm wrong, uh, I think we're kind of in more of a routine sort of maintenance kind of day-to-day stuff and the bigger projects he kind of led and got us to completion. And don't forget, and you're going to hear a little bit later, we do have some outside consultants, you know, helping us out with project review and, uh, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So that expertise is there to come to you when and if um, projects require it and actions required. And, uh, again, you know, we don't know the pro how the process will lay out, but we hope by the end of summer someone will be on board. So the the window is pretty tight, assuming we, we can find a person. So. so in a nutshell, Henry, what you're saying is you don't think it's necessary at this time? <coughs> well, I, obviously, I, you know, I have to defer to you, to the council and what you want to do, um, but uh, um, I think we've got some really strong division heads, and, uh, um, and they're going to come to us, come to me, come to you guys when we need some action. And we've got some professionals behind us that we've had in the past when John was here too, you know, because you know we have to bring on expertise uh, from from time to time. So uh, I, I kind of think it has a lot more merit once your new person gets on board, probably, uh, than now. That would be my thinking. Okay. Any other council members? Staff, do we have a motion? I think I would probably decline a motion at this time, you know, okay. in lieu of what I've heard. Okay. Maybe we could look at this again in a few months. I'm sure. Okay. Anybody else would like to make a motion? If uh, not hearing a motion, we'll move on to... Uh, the next item, which is uh, ordinance number 0415. This is an ordinance amending chapter 17 
of the City of Opaca Zoning Ordinance, and this is our second reading. Brennan, you want to just in a, a nutshell here explain what we're doing here? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, the city worked on an oversized garage ordinance that um, over the past year, um, year and a half, we've had some individuals come forward, questions, concerns have raised regarding some of the aesthetic qualities and just the requirements that were being proposed on some oversized garages. And we re more recently have had some requests for just expansions of existing residential character uh, garages. The ordinance that's in front of you this evening uh, is all encompassing for R1 and R2 properties. We took the um, comments and considerations that I've received from individuals that have approached myself or the Planning Commission and in working with the Planning Commission crafted the ordinance and that's in front of you guys tonight to establish you know guidelines and baselines for garages within the R1 and R2 area based upon acreage um, within the community. We're still allowing oversized garages and when we're talking oversized garages we're talking anything pretty much over uh, a thousand eight square feet up to about 1800 square feet we had a couple of those but <clears throat> the garages that are over a thousand eight square feet are going to be subject to a special use permit through the Planning Commission and uh, Common Council for consideration that will pr provide the opportunity for the Planning Commission to, to weigh in on the design uh, character um, and materials for those oversized garages okay and again, uh, this went through City Planning Commission, and Planning Commission did recommend uh, this to City Council, and this is the second reading of that. Um, anybody want to make any comments or a motion? I move to approve Ordinance Number 04-15. Second. A motion by Mayo, second by Olson, that we approve of Ordinance Number 0415. This is an ordinance amending... Chapter 17th of the Wapaka City Zoning Ordinance. Any discussion? If not, uh, Sandy will call the roll. Eric Olson. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Jillian Peterson. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. And Paul Hagen. Aye. Nine ayes, motion carried. All right. Thank you, Brennan, for your work on this. Uh, it, uh, it was a process, but I think we'd get a good process with some good public input. Thank you for that, and uh, I think we have a good ordinance here. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on then to uh, new business. We have a request from the Wapak Community Arts Board for its fifth annual Arts on the Square Festival, which is going to be held on August 14th and 15th. Uh, they're asking to use the city hall grounds, including the parking lot and bandstand and uh, street closures. I see Marcy's here tonight, so Marcy. Just give your name and address for the record, please. Marcy Reynolds, 407 Jefferson Street. Thanks. Uh, Marcy, just real quick, just explain to us what's going on. Okay. It's the ninth annual Arts on the Square, believe it or not. Time flies. <laughs> Um, it's a two-day, actually it's going to be a three-day festival this year. I think the retailers are planning a bunch of events on Thursday into Thursday evening. And then Friday, um, we have a national act coming for a band for the Friday Night Street Dance, which is going to be totally awesome. They're called Davina and the Vagabonds. We have an anonymous donor that's putting up all the money plus some local fundraising. Um, Saturday is going to be artists, music. There's three stages. This mic sucks. You can't say that. Sorry. <laughs> Strike that from the record. <laughs> it's feeding back. Um, we have the three tents with um, the musical acts, plus we have a fourth tent, and this is kind of bizarre. I met this... I met this guy in the subway in New York City visiting my son. He's a poet. He does poetry on demand. And he's like this really awesome guy. And he's really just this really wonderful, compassionate person. And he just happens to be crossing the country in August on his way back to New York from San Diego because he spends half the year in New York and half the year in San Diego. So he's going to come up and he's going to meet up with the, the high school group, the Dead Poets Society and work on them with some poetry. And there's going to be a whole poetry tent with a bunch of poets and a poetry workshop. And 
a poetry community art project. So it's that's our fourth entertainment tent this year. So it's going to be a little bit more going on this year than in years past. We've got the 40 juried artists. Um, we have some other kind of crazy things that I'm not going to reveal right now, um, just to kind of keep the suspense going. But um, we need to have the streets closed again for this. So it's the Fulton Street from Main Street to Jefferson. And then um, behind the library, that whole parking lot area, um, Jefferson Street for that one block, and then Union Street from Jefferson to Main. So no additional street closures required for this fantastic event. All right. And uh, no other request uh, of the city besides <coughs> that? No. Um, we'll be doing our annual request for the beer license, but that's a separate issue, and we'll just deal with that in okay. whatever process that needs. Okay. Awesome. Marcy. So, any questions? Uh, we'd be looking for a motion then to approve the uh, street closures uh, for this uh, very fun event uh, that they have. I move to approve. Second. We have a motion by Keelan and second by Hacken that we uh, approve of the Wapak Community Arts Board request to uh, close the streets uh, and you heard Marcy's uh, request for East Fulton Street and uh, Union Street as well as part of Jefferson Street. <coughs> Any discussion? If not, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, next we have uh, engineering. Good luck, Marcy. I'm sure we'll see you in the next uh, couple meetings yet too. Yep, thank you. <laughs> Uh, engineering contract for the water main improvements. Uh, this uh, is uh, Henry. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my uh, item starts on page uh, 232 of your packet. There's a cover memo, a couple uh, uh, aerials, and Omni's uh, proposed contract. I do have Phil Ramlett. He is in the audience. Phil is our Omni representative if you have any specific questions. but. If you remember back uh, at the April 21st meeting, John Edelbeck did uh, give a presentation on our water system and is uh, proposed that we move forward with uh, the engineering to uh, uh, make these improvements. One project would be uh, to loop our system out by the Highway 54, um, Highway, 20, uh, Highway 54, Highway, uh, US 10 interchange along Fulton Street and then uh, looping the system um, behind Kmart. Uh, this would uh, help our reliability and uh, improve the system a great deal. Uh, the cost of the proposal is um, $18,440 to uh, design uh, both projects. Uh, there are some easement requirements, possibly up to eight, four for each project. It'll just depend on, on alignments, and we won't know for sure, but that would be an addition. So I guess the maximum cost would, could be up to $26,440. Um, I don't know if you have any questions on it. You can see the, from the aerials uh, kind of the tentative alignments, but the, again, they have to be designed. Uh, the idea is to design the uh, projects this year and bid them out next next year. And then next year, I'm, I'm assuming there would be some construction staking and project uh, you know, oversight uh, agreement that would come forward later. Uh, obviously, our new DPW would manage these projects and, and, and bring them through to conclusion. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions. Um, this is a pretty straightforward contract. You've seen the, a dozen of these through the years uh, or more. Uh, so I don't know if you have any questions for Phil on the project. Uh, Let me just ask one, that the one closest to town, that has no effect on the Piotr story up there? No. Behind if you that? remember that line, uh, that 10-inch line, kind of in the old alignment of uh, <sighs> High, Highland? Or, uh, Highland Crest. Highland Crest. I might call it Highland Drive. Um, it's still there. And uh, with staff's uh, help, we were able to design kind of a footprint of, a th of another building that could be built without encroaching on that line. So, no, it doesn't affect that at all. Okay. Phil, anything you, you drove over here? You got anything to <laughs> add to this or anything? I mean, 
Well, uh, the only thing I was going to say for the forensics teacher, you know, when I took forensics in high school, they always said the first thing you do is take a look at the Gettysburg Address and kind of tailor your comments about to that length of time. So, <laughs> that was the only thing I thought. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, thanks. Uh, remember that uh, this uh, contract that we will be entering into, if you agree to this, is uh, the water utilities. So this is uh, will not be coming out of the general fund, but it will actually be coming out of the water utility fund. And uh, I think the motion should say that uh, not to exceed, if you're okay with that, of $26,440. That's right, because the final alignment, Mayor, uh, would dictate then the type of how many easements that we would need for the project. Okay, good. <coughs> Anybody that would like to make that motion? I'll make that into a motion. Second. Motion by Whitman. Second. Second by Prochatsky that we approve of the engineering contract with Omni and Associates for the water main improvement at a cost not to exceed $26,440. <coughs> Any discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Alan Keelan. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Jillian Peterson. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. And Paul Mayo. Aye. Nine ayes. Motion carried. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. All right, next we have a uh, sewer service charge concern. We have a resident uh, that uh, does uh, pay water and sewer. His name is Shannon Haskell. Shannon, I assume, is here. If you would, just step up to the podium. Uh, d let me set this up real quick here. Uh, Council, you, in your packet, starting on page 247, you got the information, but then uh, Shannon, uh, as he said in his uh, uh, email, he had talked to older person Keelan and then uh, had rewritten it with some changes in there and so on and Sandy did put that on your desk uh, as well as uh, she did send you an email um, yesterday I think it was or Friday today? probably on or Friday today? Or was it this okay it time spreads so Shannon we all had this in our packet had a pretty good chance to to read it so if you don't mind just uh, give us a brief summary of what you're requesting here and gotcha and well I apologize for the last minute uh, changes and stuff on that so okay all right well just some background I live on uh, 1025 Riverside Drive it's an apartment complex with four bedroom or four one bedroom apartments and uh, this issue concerns me as well as the three others that live in the building now I started paying for water and sewer around November of 2014 and I noticed that my monthly bill seemed a little high and as I began to do some digging, I narrowed it down to a charge called the sewer service charge, which is a fixed charge each month of $24.21. Not to be confused with the volume charge. And that, that's the amount that we're charged for the volume of sewage that leaves the, the residents. Now, the sewer service charge deals with basically three things. Paying off the debt accumulated by putting in the current sewer system, as well as the lift stations. Creating a fund to replace the sewer system, the lift stations, and the treatment plant as they get old and the property liability insurance. Now the sewer service charge was created by the city to ensure that everyone pays their fair share to help pay off this debt to save for future replacements and the property <coughs> liability insurance. Now according to the municipal code, um, that if there's any discrepancies with this charge, then the city has the ability to make those type of adjustments. Now the sewer service charge is a fixed monthly charge determined by the diameter of the meter needed to service the building. So for an example, a 5 8 or a 3 8 inch meter would be 2421 for the whole building and that goes up to a six inch meter which is one thousand two hundred and eleven dollars so all right so this is my concern now I don't mind paying my fair share to help pay off the debt and the other things but my concern is the building located on 1025 Riverside Drive is paying more than its fair share so I'm asking the city to listen closely to what I'm about to share so you can clearly see the issue and make an informed decision about what I'm about the concern so I'd like to share with you two scenarios now, the first scenario, the building on 1025 Riverside Drive can be operated um, off one meter and has been for many years. With one meter, our fair share of the debt, future replacement fund, and property liability insurance would cost the building as a whole $24.21 a month. Let me let me correct you real quick here. Yes. Uh, we did our own research here, and this okay. never did have one meter. 
Okay, that's what I was told, and then the landlord said he'd switched it over to four. Okay, he paid for all four of the bills and then included it basically in your rent, but there's always been four meters to this four meters there. Okay, but it can okay. be operated off one meter. I talked to John about that. So it can operate off one okay. meter. Okay, so I apologize for that. That's what I was told. So, all right, so it can operate off the one meter, which would be the 2421 per month. Now that cost per the year would be two ninety fifty two. If you spread that across ten years, it's two thousand nine hundred five dollars. Twenty years is five thousand eight hundred four. <coughs> now the second scenario is that we have the four meters on there. Okay, with the extra meters, what we're looking at paying as a building as a whole is ninety six eighty four per month. All right, for the year it goes from two ninety to one thousand one hundred sixty two, a difference of nine hundred dollars. The cost over a 10-year period is 11620 a difference of nine, uh, close to 9000 And if you look at over a 20-year period, we're looking at going from $5,804 to $23,000, which is about a $17,000 difference. Now, most would agree that if you're going to pay more for something, there should be a logical reason to do that. If it can be operated off one meter, you know, we should be subject to the 2421 charge. So there, should, there ought to be some sort of causation. So my question is, if it can operate off the one meter, you know, what items on the sewer service charge, if you look at the former debt, the future replacement fund, or the liability insurance, increases as a result of adding those three meters? Does that make sense? And if there is no increase, then would it be fair for the building on 1025 Riverside Drive to pay more than its fair share, paying nearly $17,000 more over a 20-year period? So I guess here's my proposal. I guess this is what I would suggest. As the meter, as mentioned above, the monthly fixed sewer service charge is determined by the diameter of the meter needed to run the building. So let's say our building only requires the three fourth inch meter to run the building. So if the city has determined that's our fair share of the debt, future fund and insurance, um, the building should never have to pay over the 2421 per month. So the only way I think would be make it to be fair would be to determine the meter size, what meter size would be efficient for running that whole building. And, run, and divide that by the number of meters used to service that apartment building. So an example would be, if it only takes one meter to efficiently run our building, it would be to take that 24, 21 and divide it by the four meters. All right, does that make sense? Because currently our building's paying 2684, which is equivalent to a building with a one inch and one half inch meter. So just to give you an idea, you know, buildings that run off a one inch, one and a half inch meters are buildings such as car washes you know, smaller manufacturing nursing homes. So our building as a whole is paying as much as a car wash would pay for its, you know, part of the debt, part of the liability of that insurance, as well as the replacement. So that's kind of what we're looking at. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Does that make sense? Mayor, um, if, is there an ordinance in place that requires every unit of an apartment building to have a separate water meter? Do you know? Well, no, there isn't. Um, and so, I mean, I don't okay. No, There is. Okay. If there isn't, I, do we have jurisdiction here on this? I mean, uh, Mr. Haskell is not the owner of the building. Shouldn't he be talking to the owner of the building? And if the owner, he can convince the owner of the building to go to one meter, then the owner can get together with his plumber and Mark Nolenberg and they can make things work conversion. I mean, I'm not sure what we are here to decide tonight. There's no ordinance involved here. Um, I think his request is a little bit different than that, Paul, but yeah, I get your mm -hmm. point. I mean, if, if you want to go just back to one meter uh, or go to a one meter system, that can be done. Uh, it certainly can be done, but I don't, Shannon, that, that's not your request though. You're not requesting that it goes back. Go to back one to meter. one meter. No, I think the landlord does that because of past issues of people not paying you know, on their debts. So that way he can measure the proper amount and take them to court to get his fair amount of water back, which makes sense. It's the same way the utility runs. You know, we run a meter to each particular house. If someone doesn't pay their bills, you know, we cut off their water or we take them to court or whatever the process is to get that money. The landlord's doing the same thing the utility is doing. So it wouldn't be fair to ask him to do anything different. So I guess what I'm proposing is that as the ordinance that we would look at the type of meter that would run the building. So our building we could be running off a three or three fourths inch meter, meaning that our only obligation for the debt, for the replacement, as well as the insurance would be 24, 21 <coughs> as a building as a whole. 
So what he did, he just takes that and he's dividing that by four. So every time we add a meter, we double our responsibility to so, pay off. So you're saying you want to have four meters on it, but only pay for one? No, they will still be paying for one. It can run off the one meter, the 2421. That's our obligation, according to the, the ordinance, is our obligation for that building. It's 2421 per month to help pay off the debt for the replacement fund as well as the liability insurance. So you want to inactivate three of the meters and run off a of one meter? No, is to take whatever meter is efficient and divide that by the incremental meters that are going into the building. So basically we're just taking that 2421, the meter that is efficient to run it, and then dividing that by the four meters. So each building would pay $6.05. So essentially you want to have four meters and only pay for one? No, we're still paying for the appropriate meter. I, I think you missed the point though, on the volumetric charges now. With only a single meter, you can't equitably divide the usage between the four different apartments. No, I want, I want to keep the three meters, the four meters on there. It's just divide that cost up between the four apartments. He's just, yeah. I mean, again, he's, he's, he's not asking that it go from four meters to one meter. And, I, and he's just asking that the price be divided between four because it's one address. It's one property. That's what he's asking for. Because you can see the incremental. I guess my question would be, you know, by adding the charges, what effect does that have? you know, on the debt, the liability, as well as the, the insurance, as well as the replacement fund. You know, because every time we add a meter, we're increasing that, or doubling that. So now we're four, three or four times the amount that we originally are obligated to pay if we just had the one meter. And you can see the cost variation. Over a 20-year period, we're paying $17,000 more than it's required. So if you look at the price we pay as a whole as a building, we're paying $96 which is equivalent to a one and a half meter, which is used by car washes, nursing homes, and small manufacturing. That's what, that's what we're paying currently by having the four meters. By adding the meters, you're not adding any extra. You're not adding anything to the debt. You're not adding anything to the replacement fund or the liability insurance. So I'm just asking that as a building that we pay our fair share, which I have no problem doing. Does that make sense? Paul Hagan. Um, if you, in, in a building of multiple unit building, mm -hmm. each person who has a landline for a telephone pays a customer fee. Each person who has natural gas pays an individual fee. Each person who pays electric has, has a type of base fee that they pay just like I have at my house. So, I mean, what you're, what you're asking to do really is, is, is bucking a, a a well-established system here of how utilities charge their customers. Um, the 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 logic of it, you know, might be something that that you can defend, but the whole system the whole system is is based on each individual consumer paying a type of fee that um, supports that type of utility. Well, like it was mentioned, though, we could go back to one meter, and the building as a whole is only going to be paying twenty four twenty one. And the and the and the the building the building owner could do that. Mm -hmm. But our obligation goes three times the amount if we add to three extra meters. And that was my point. <coughs> you know, how does that affect the debt and the liability and the service charge? You know, what changes that enforces us to pay three times the amount we were paying before? So, and that was that's why I suggested that. Okay. That you look at what meter efficiently runs the building and divide that by the number of apartments or meters that service that building. Okay. Henry, you had? Well, I, I think the 2421 is sort of our one residential unit. The, the way we, and ta Mr. Taryn Nall's here who helped us devise our, our uh, usage, uh, user fee system, that's basically a residential unit and you have basically four residences in there. So. I think that's sort of maybe the confusion or the rub. Um, now, one meter versus four, but the 2421 is based on all these individual residential units, and I think that's why what that's devised from. Beyond that, uh, there's probably a lot more to the methodology uh, if you had any more questions that, that I couldn't answer. Um. Anybody have any questions? Any other comments? Chuck, go ahead. Well, I would presume this is not the only building like this in the city. 
Are there other apartment buildings? Oh, sure there are. You know, Mark's not here. I don't know if Roger. There has to be some other ones that are like this. So mm -hmm. it would be more of an impact than just this one building on the city side. So. Absolutely. Right. I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, if we re if we think it's fair and we reduce his cost here, it doesn't reduce the city's cost. Right. So it's going to be passed on to other customers, obviously. And the more people that fit into this, the more we're going to have to raise other people's costs to make sure that uh, this this fee gets covered. Well, and don't forget, each of those meters that you would still leave in your building has a cost itself. It's not insignificant. Well, the, most of the cost goes towards your volume charge. Now, as far as the sewer service charge, there's only three, three things to consider. It's the debt that we have for putting in our current sewer system. We're paying that off. We have a replacement fund that we're initiating, as well as the liability insurance that they have. So those are the only three things that are considered in the sewer service charge. Everything else is considered under your volume charge. So really, by adding three meters, you're not changing the debt, you're not changing the replacement fund, you're not changing the liability insurance, you're not doing anything other than our building now is paying three times the amount it did before. And that was kind of my thing, what is our fair amount? And I don't mind paying my fair amount, but I feel like we're paying three times the amount we're supposed to be paying for that building. Here, um, you bring up the uh, issue of fairness. Um, what about the uh, individual in a house that only uses half the capacity of their three-quarter inch meter? Should they pay half the service fee? It would it would be the same. I mean, because we could go right now. I can we can go there and we can change the meters back to one meter. And our only obligation for the insurance as well as the liability insurance and the debt would be twenty four twenty one. Well, you're going to have four meters. You're saying you essentially use one quarter of its capacity, so you should pay. No, one we could, we could go down to one meter at okay. that building. That's what I suggest you do. Well, it would be an option, but that's not my call. And my call is just to figure out, you know, what is the, what is the fair amount for that building to pay. Yeah. Darren, uh, do you want to use a microphone or you want to just stand right up there? Okay. Oh, yeah. Just give your name, Taryn, so for council members that do not know you. Taryn Nall, Kempfer & Associates, O'Connell Falls, Wisconsin. We, we initially did the major user charge uh, creation back in 1995. At that time, it was uh, strictly regulated by DNR on how to get equitable distribution of costs. And if you look throughout Wisconsin, except for a few minor cases, maybe in very small communities, much smaller than Wapaka, everybody uses the number of meters that a cu customers have to distribute the fixed costs. At the time we created your user charge system, back in 95 and since that time John had us updated about three times I believe in that since that time we've stayed with that methodology it's sound and if you go away if you get, uh, allow exemptions for certain users you better make the exemptions fair across the board for every user in the system and uh, the the meter chart uh, uh, the, me the use of meters for fixed charges can be challenged, just like this, uh, your alderman said about someone who uses half. We have a, I have a resident down in, by Fond du Lac that uses about 3,000 gallons a year. Normally, the normal residential customer uses about 40,000. This woman uses about 3,000 a year. Does she get a break on a three-quarter inch meter? No. Or five-eighths inch meter? No. She pays the, the fixed charge that just is almost universally accepted. The only time you don't have meters if, is if you have a uh, community without water. And then you go to equivalent housing units. So how many equivalent housing units are, are in a four apartment building? Normally you'd say four. So, you know, the whole, uh, the whole thing, you know, and uh, the thought that he had about the uh, having one meter and it's gonna be $21 just doesn't hold weight unless your water department decides that a three quarter inch meter can serve four apartments, which I don't think it, they will. Uh, AWWA has a set manual on sizing meters and services to, to properties, and it's all based on fixtures and things like that. And I can leave a copy of that with Henry uh, to uh, you know go over 
uh, with you maybe when you have time. I could talk about user charges for two hours, <laughs> but you don't want that. So uh, I, I, I feel that you have a fair system. PSC was contacted, as I indicated in the letter to you, or to Henry, um, and PSC said, hey, just if the user charges are fair, equitable, that you're not discriminating against any user, they don't have any problem at all with it. I went through the our methodology that we use, which they see used throughout the Wisconsin. You know, they don't they, they don't have any issues with it. So, um, if you want to change anything, you can, but you got to make it universal and not just for one user out in the and give them preferential treatment. Can't do that. And if you do that, you'll probably have 99.99 percent of your uh, users in the system challenge it because they aren't going to be treated fairly then. Everyone uses a certain amount of water and the, the use of the meters has just been universally accepted for distribution of that cost. It's unfair. It could be considered unfair for certain users, but universally you got to look at the, the broad picture of it and the distribution by uh, meter size and numbers is appropriate to use. Dave, you had, thank you, Taryn. Dave, did you have anything, or? I don't think there's really much to add from my viewpoint. Uh, <clears throat> it seems like it's universal across Wisconsin. I think we would open up a big can of worms. Maybe every duplex would then come in, and not one line, and I think it would be a real problem. Okay. Um, since there there is a request, and it is on the agenda, I would ask that uh, we make a motion either in the affirmative or in the negative uh, on this request uh, from Mr. Haskell. I'll make a motion we deny the request. Second. We have a motion by Hackett, second by Hagen, that we deny the request for the change of uh, sewer rate charges on the, based on the meters on the property. Any discussion? I just have one question. Does Mr. Haskell have a copy of this letter that's in our package? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other discussion? If not, uh, Sandy will call the roll. Jillian Peterson? Aye. Chuck Whitman? Aye. Dave Peterson? Aye. Eric Olson? Aye. Paul Mayo? Aye. Paul Hagen? Aye. Alan Keeland? Aye. Uh, Steve Hackett. Aye. And Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Nine ayes. Motion carried. Okay. Um, next, we'll move on then to the recommendations uh, to move Kathy Kaza from uh, our finance director treasurer from her probationary status to full time regular employment status. Uh, Henry, you want to get us up to date on that? Yeah, I'm trying to find uh, the number here I'm sorry 53. okay 253 uh, my memo uh, outlines it um, oh god let me get here thank you yeah this is uh, my memo uh, recommending that we move our finance director from our probationary status to uh, full-time regular uh, status um, I put the rationale uh, in, in there. I, I believe uh, that uh, Kathy's bringing a lot of experience and knowledge and some of her network uh, to bear for us. Uh, you just heard in her report today uh, being able to access uh, a connection to help us with a cash flow statement, development of cash flow statement using somebody else's intern. Uh, so I think these are just the kinds of things that she does in approaching her job. Um, I can tell you that there's been some process improvements in our area that have been uh, well received. I think our, our, our folks that report to her think a lot of her. Um, and, you know, she's learning our culture. Um, we uh, play nice up here. We're not so contra maybe contra <laughs> confrontational as maybe you're used to, but uh, we, uh, we uh, are all integrating and getting uh, used to working with her, and I think she brings a lot to uh, the table. and. Uh, in her short time, you've seen some fruits of her, her labor. So I, I, I don't hesitate recommending her to full-time regular status, is how it's termed in our handbook. 
And uh, as she was in probation, um, she did not uh, receive the pay increase that uh, the other employees received in January. So I would recommend that she be eligible for that, you know, on uh, approval of this today. It would not be retroactive back to January 1, but one, the day of her going to regular status. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I move to approve. Second. Motion by mail, second by Keelan, that we approve of uh, moving our finance director, Kathy Kaza, from uh, probationary status to full-time uh, employment status effective uh, May 19th today okay thanks Sandy uh, and also give her the cost of living increase 2.5 percent any discussion all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. against motion carried Okay, next we have a request by the Wapak Area Chamber of Commerce for uh, street closures for Strawberry Fest on June 19th uh, and 20th, 2015, and then also for the hometown days on July 4th, 2015. Mitch? Again, just give us your name and who you're representing, Mitch. For okay, Mitch Swenson from the Wapaka Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we would like to request uh, the use of the city square grounds and surrounding streets. And uh, this request is being submitted following the guidelines set by the city council at the April 19th, 1994 council meeting for the two events, Strawberry Fest, Friday through Saturday, June 19th through the 20th, and Hometown Day, Saturday, July 4th, 2015. And for Strawberry Fest, the request is the block of Main Street from Fulton to Granite Streets is needed Saturday. The block of Fulton Street from Main Street to Jefferson Streets and the city library uh, parking lot will be needed Friday through Saturday. Additionally, for uh, Hometown Day, uh, we would like permission to once again close County K from the cemetery to the recycling center. Uh, in the evening for the fireworks. The road uh, will be closed to pedestrian traffic to leave a clear path for emergency vehicles. And uh, a certificate of, of insurance would be coming to the city from Johnson Insurance Agency uh, in the near future. Okay, and this is not any different than your request in the past. And Mitch, as in the past, to you, uh, the chamber is, uh, sent out a letter to the business owners that has been a, that's affected by these closures and so on do you plan on doing that again this year yes okay anybody else have any questions of mitch <clears throat> i just have a question um Go ahead. since this is county k do we is is do you need county permission to or, or well, i was going to bring that up paul it's not county k anymore Oh, okay. I'm Short just drive. seeing what he, what he has. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, County Key actually is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, I was going to ask if we had to change that. So, yeah. Seems that's not County Key there anymore. Yeah, it's actually what? Lakeside Parkway. Parkway. Lakeside Parkway. Parkway. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Okay, okay. I was wondering about that. Yeah. I, I, Thank you. I, I thought the same thing. Um, and then do you want to, do you want to put in there anything about, since the cemetery is pretty much the entire, like the begin, the cemetery near, Lake Street, or I mean, or do we? Is that sufficient? I think we we all know what it, what they mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, we're I okay with that. that. <laughs> just call me too literal. <laughs> Anybody? Any other comments? Uh, motion. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion by Olson, second by Hagen, that we approve of the. Uh, Request from the Chamber of Commerce for street closures for hometown days on July 4th and then also Strawberry Fest on June 19th through the 20th. Any further discussion? <coughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Thank Mitch, you. thank you. Good luck. All right, uh, next we have approve uh, upgrade to financial software. Kathy, you're going to earn that raise right now. Yeah? Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight, I also have in, uh, to help 
in the presentation, um, which will be short. Um, Mike Lesh from Civic Software. Um, I had him come up just in case any of the council members had any questions regarding um, the agreement that um, was provided. Uh, the city's software um, is the older version of, um, of financial software that really li limits the procedural efficiencies that can be um, garnered with uh, upgrade in the financial software. Uh, in my past experience, uh, which was like three years ago, I went out for uh, RFP for financial software uh, and it ran uh, about 150 to $500,000 out there. For, and even talking to another vendor that would have uh, provided us with a quote, um, she told us what we had budgeted would probably only buy us um, our general ledger module only. So it's uh, very expensive and it's a very um, time consuming uh, change in the way we do um, financial reporting. So um, the fiscal responsibility of my office was to look for a cheaper version that would fit within budget. And uh, Civic Software has uh, a upgraded version that runs on a SQL Server, which is another operating Microsoft operating uh, system, and uh, would provide uh, with, on, with budget a um, dashboard to department heads who would um, be able to use uh, the internet to see the status of their accounts, uh, employee information on payroll without having to call my office. Um, it would also provide security by using usernames and passwords, which our current system does not, which would help in um, protecting the database. Uh, it also um, does a better reporting in that uh, there's a option in that's included in the quote to use Excel uh, worksheets that will automatically update that worksheet with the financial data that's in the system by just changing the date uh, in the in the in the spreadsheet. Um, so. Um, Part of my um, ex past experience has been um, with Civic Software on the newer version, so uh, we would um, save time in training. My staff is currently uh, used to using the same platform. Um, the, the menus are the same. Uh, there's just some more um, functionality within the system. And um, Civic has been uh, gracious enough to uh, give us a 50% uh, discount on the license fees. Um, they will also do a three-year no interest financing option, uh, which would allow me to incorporate into the 2016, 17, and 18 budget the general operating fund um, portion of the licensing fees and not have to go out and borrow for it. Um, so I'm bringing this forward from the fact that uh, I would like to get on the schedule, which is filling up fast uh, at the company, to uh, start the implementation this year uh, with the funding to come from the utilities to start off with. And then um, purchase the equipment and uh, go forward with uh, including it in the budget for uh, the future years instead of borrowing. I'd save some money that way. Um, Mike, do you want to add anything? No, I, I think that you pretty much hit all, the, hit all the topics. I don't know if there's any questions that you said. Let, me, let me ask you one yeah. question, Mike. From a, from a council standpoint and even the citizens that are watching us tonight, what does this do for us? Well, basically, one of the biggest things is, is 
going back to the risk assessment standards to take a look at take a look at what the software can do in order to uh, maintain security within the within the financial system. Um, I think Kathy alluded to this about uh, username and passwords. Um, any type of any type of transaction is done within the system. Um, you have the ability now to be able to track who made that transaction, when it was made, what it was changed from and to, and uh, date stamped also. Um, that's, that's some of the functionality within the software. Okay, good. Eric? How old is the current system that we use and how long can we expect to use this system? Yeah, the current system that you guys are on right now was written in 99. Um, so, and I think you guys came on board pretty close right after that um, onto the classic version. And it's written in Access, and that's kind of the reason why we're migrating people over to our SQL version is just because it's an Access version of product. Um, we just can't do any more programming to enhance the capabilities in the Access version. So we have switched platforms, and now we're working on the SQL version. So, and, oh, and, and to answer your question about how long in the foreseeable future can you be utilizing this program, um, this program has now been in place for approximately five years total. Um, the last three years has been, we've finally got all the modules over to the Clarity version. Um, you won't only be getting access to this version, but then also our next version, which is in development. So, so I, I, you never can tell with software, but I, I, I have a, a strong, strong uh, peace of mind thinking that you'd get at least eight, ten years out of it, if not more. Could you speak to some of the uh, what some of the efficiencies that we might be gaining by doing this? Definitely, definitely. And Kathy talked about the My Viewpoint tool. Um, on the My Viewpoint tool for the department heads, they can actually take a look at their uh, real-time budget to actual, um, so they get actual up-to-date numbers within that product. Um, they can take a look in, and see their vendors that they've made payments to, see if checks have cleared for those particular vendors like that without at a snap of a finger without having to call Kathy and, and take her off of whatever she's doing at that point in time to answer those questions. Uh, on top of that, the My, the My Excel tool that, that uh, Kathy would be utilizing for the general ledger and the accounts payable to direct connect from, from um, Excel into into the general ledger database or the AP database or the payroll database. And what that allows her, her to do is to be able to build her spreadsheets right within, within Excel that she's probably utilizing right now. Um, and instead of having to rekey that information in, she's just able to change dates and all that information will actually pull into the system. And on top of that, budget, budgets, entering in budgets, you can just enter it in right from, from Excel and import it right into the system rather than rekeying it. So those are some of the, some of the added functionalities. I don't even know if the old software offers this, but does does the new software also have an audit trail for you too to to follow? It, it does. Okay. It does have an audit trail. Uh, on top of that, too, um, some of the other inf efficiencies that I didn't uh, we didn't talk about was um, electronic steps checklist uh, for cross training within within the city too. Is um, each module you can have a steps checklist and things that need to be done on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. Um, in the old access system, all you had was a, was a sheet, I mean, just a Word document or a PDF that you could look at, go down the line, see what you had to do next, didn't know where to go in the software. This one is actually uh, hyperlinked right from that checklist. So you, you see what you've done in the past, you can click on the next item to be done, and it'll take you right to that point in the software. If for some reason Kathy was out for a couple days and, um, and, or her payroll person was out for a couple days and, and the payroll person needed to uh, let the next person know where, where she left off, she could just take that step checklist, mark off the things that she did do, email it on to Kathy, and then Kathy could just jump in and then, then click on the next items and take it right to that point in the software. She doesn't have to know exactly, exactly how to get around in the software, but she just needs to be able to click the buttons and get, get to the point that she needs to be. Another audit feature that's available is, is that if somebody goes in and changes a employee's uh, record, um, an email can get sent to me saying so-and-so went and changed that rate or that person's address or that social security number within that. The nice thing about the security is it's, it's menu driven and even goes uh, so that if I had a person in my office that can look at something but can't change anything, I can have them do that or they could just run a report. Uh, the nice thing with the dashboard is that the departments can run um, their reports uh, and set them up 
um, they can also have spreadsheets that can update them so they can see um, um, how much overtime is being spent within their department how much uh, uh, payroll payroll is costing them at a certain time um, what the much vacation time sick leave time is available to each employee uh, and if we can even get it to that point where um, if we needed to we could print out a, a secondary second check stub for an employee who's lost it so it's uh, uh, very functional uh, very efficient um, definitely get rid of um, our handwritten cash receipts within our department uh, and some of the other uh, redundancies that we're doing right now so um, I think uh, going for it's a it's a good step going forward uh, to provide um, efficiencies and um, within budget yeah, I think we're gonna see and, and I talked to Kathy uh, quite a bit about this too but I think you're gonna see too even at the budget process this is gonna be part of what's gonna help us to be a little bit more interactive with our budget too where if there's a line item that's going to be changed Kathy is almost going to immediately be able to tell us what the bottom line and what that change will be and part of this is being able to use this software to get us to that point so well and the nice thing too is is that with my with my viewpoint the departments will be able to at, enter their line item um, I right into the software I won't really have to re-enter it so that's there's efficiencies there awesome Mayor, I'd like to move to approve uh, the upgrade to financial software. Okay. Um, let me read what we have here, and, and this is what your motion is to make sure. Okay, Paul? Moved by mail, second by <laughs> Olson, that uh, the council approve the upgrade to the city financial software with civic systems in the amount of $46,700 to be paid over three years with no interest being charged and a staff training uh, or equipment in the amount of $13,300 for total cost not to exceed $60,000, which the funding will come from uh, uh, the capital projects, water to utility, and, and also the sewer utility funds. Does that make sense? Okay. Eric, you okay with that? All right. Uh, any further discussion? Sandy will call the roll. Eric Olson. Aye. Alan Keelan? Aye. Steve Hackett? Aye. Dave Peterson? Aye. Paul Hagen? Aye. Paul Mayo? Aye. Scott Prochatsky? Aye. Chuck Whitman? Aye. And Jillian Peterson? Aye. Nine ayes. Motion carried. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mike. <coughs> Appreciate you coming in. Uh, next, we're going to go, this is still Kathy here, approval of a revised employment travel policy. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the travel policy that is currently in the municipal code and in the employee handbook and administrative supplement um, is very broad. Um, and I've um, brought um, some train, some po uh, travel policy from um, my previous employer who uh, I've taken from the city of Green Bay, um, which is one of my contacts. Uh, so I'm um, requesting that it'll give the policy that is in the handbook and simplify, will be simplifying the municipal code if the policy is changed to um, allow for more um, specifics as to how employees travel and how they're reporting. Um, I did um, receive Alderman Hackett's recommended changes in the forms, and those will be included in the final documents um, as far as formatting. And uh, it just makes a standardization for all of the reporting. Right now I'm getting different reports from the library for travel, the police department, rec department, and I think that it, a standardized policy um, that uh, encompasses the whole city would... Uh, be more efficient and um, have better guidelines by not putting a lot of the language within the ordinance it gives the council t um, 
the ability to change the policy instead of having to rewrite the ordinance and publish it and everything else. So it's, it's changing um, more to uh, a generalized um, statement in the, in the municipal code and the um, travel policy being more dynamic and, and first in the uh, employee policy handbook. And you see this as an annual approval of this policy? Uh, no, I think, if anything, uh, we'll probably just bring back any changes, um, like to the IRS um, um, rate of, pay, of mileage, if it, depending on what that is, if that's the case, or if there comes to a point where we see um, that uh, there's a need to tighten up some of the travel uh, going forward due to budget um, kind of look at that, but I want to say it's a very um, uh, <coughs> comprehensive policy uh, in, in regards to employee travel and how we reimburse the employees for that travel. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Um, can I... I you were just short on specifics for me. Okay. I, I heard dynamic. I heard a lot of generalizations. I didn't hear a lot of specifics as to why we need to do this, other than standardization, standardization of forms. Well, there's nothing in the, your um, ordinance nor in your employee handbook in that in, in following um, how hours of work when somebody <coughs> travels. This is included in this policy. So if somebody is under FLSA, the, uh, you would um, have them, if they travel during their work hours or after their hours, have a, um, a reason why you would pay them and why you wouldn't pay them. Um, you also have uh, whether uh, in there whether or not um, that, sorry, that when you're traveling with your spouse or your family, that the city will not pay any of those costs. Um, there's a code of conduct um, and procedures in, in reporting uh, back uh, with a travel authorization prior to traveling, and then the uh, receipts um, and the report being uh, filled out with a specific report form uh, to the finance department for approval. So I think it's the standardization and some of the other language in, you know, that you can only use coach or economy fares. It, it gets into more specifics than what the ordinance did and the handbook. Okay. Now, now my question would be, I guess, first of all, the UTAM, uh, is this, is this uh, being, is this something that the police commission to approve, in your opinion? Um, because we're because what we're doing is in the library also I mean there that this is something that would be able to be applied to them without their approval well everything with us with optional powers training expenses uh, travel was approved by them so we would just be apparently just using this form and the dollar amounts set forward okay. did you get input into this Aware um, of yeah, this has been going on. It, there was one recommendation regarding internet access at training sites that was changed. But as far as us, you know, the approval process doesn't really apply because we're independent, and I suspect that the library would be the same. We would just be utilizing, to my understanding, we would just be utilizing this electronic form that I'm looking at that's included in the packet. There were some changes that needed to be made because it was not accurate anymore either. And one of them that that uh, Kathy brought up too was is that the uh, mileage rate would be set by the finance committee each year. Well, we don't have a finance committee, so obviously there's some changes. That's just one example of of a change that needed to be made. Um, <clears throat> Overall, I'm supportive of what, what's being proposed here, but I look at the form and it requires three approvals, which to me I think is a little bit bureaucratic. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, well, there would be the employee and then department head. And city administrator, clerk, and finance director. So that's three approvals. I think that's overkill. Well, I, I think I made that form generic in that um, department heads have to have the city administrator, but if it was a regular employee, they would only need to have their supervisor. And then I usually sign all of the bills that are with, that come to me for for payment. So if we wouldn't we wouldn't have the city administrator only on the department heads. Um, just like the city administrator has the mayor approve his travel. So if I, you know, I could, it's an electronic form I can change and make it, you know, whatever easier. But I just thought I incorporated all the signatures that needed to be done for the majority of the employees. The only, and I'm, I guess I'm okay with it if, if the majority is okay with this too, but the only thing that I noticed that will be quite a bit different will be the mileage rate will be set by the Internal Revenue Service if we accept this, um, which is okay. I mean, it, you cannot go above what the IRS is rate is, but you can always go less than that if you want to. So if council wants the ability to pay less than the IRS rate, this would be the time to discuss that. If you're okay with the, whatever the Internal Revenue Service uh, applies for that amount, uh, then we would leave as is. I mean, everything else that's in here, council decides on a budget, budgetary year. So. Again. Yeah, the IRS rate is pretty standard with employers. I see it all over the place, and I, I'd. Well, it's pretty standard with it, with big business. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well. All right. Yeah. I mean, I again, I. Being in a small community different. and having small businesses, I I see that rate is, is a lot less than the, than the allowable IRS rate, and that's the only reason I bring it up. I mean, again, I'm okay with it if you want to do that. I just want you to understand that you're you're basing it on on what the IRS is giving for the rate. What is our current rate now? It went to is it fifty eight and a half? It's, it's fifty seven and a half. Fifty seven and a half cents. Wasn't well, the IRS around fifty six? No, 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 no. That's how much the IRS well, rate is. What is what is our right? We've been going by the IRS well, even though it doesn't. Yeah. Oh. We've been Okay. But don't department heads get a, a mileage allowance? In, is that in addition to or instead of? That's a dollar amount, though. Right, and but, it, but it's a fixed, fixed amount. I understand that. But is it in addition to or instead of the IRS reimbursement? It would be instead of the IRS reimbursement if you were given a, a, a stipend for mileage. And are we going to continue that for department heads? I guess that's a question I would have, too. Well... And and I think the department, department heads choose not to uh, be accountable for their, <laughs> yeah. well, I hate to say that, but this is how the IRS would say it. So it's included in their income. Right. If they were given a stipend, it's included in their income. Right. If this is, this is, if you report it on this form, it's a reimbursement of expense. So this is not reported to the, on your W-2s. Our, our policy is is a stipend covers travel and uh, around the city and within Wapaka County. If you're traveling outside the county to day meeting or whatever, then that's when this Form policy seven. kicks okay. in. It also does in the policy recommend using um, city vehicles if for travel to avoid the cost. Okay. Again, I think it's a it's a step up from where we're at. Uh, some of this stuff, in my mind, is is uh, you shouldn't have to be concerned about if you take your spouse. You shouldn't have the enter that amount. And I don't know that any of our employees would do that, but it's it's defined here. So I, I think all of those things are good. I don't think it, there's anything wrong with that. 
So, what do you think? Motion? I'll make this into a motion there. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by, again, I'm, I'm going to hope that I know what your motion is here. A motion by Whitman and a second by Keelan that we approve of the revised employee travel policy as printed in your packet. Yes. Okay, Alan? Yes. All right, any discussion? If not, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. All right, uh, Josh, you got to come out from behind the camera here. Uh, renewal of the charter communications contract. Um, we met with our charter sales rep, I think, about a month ago to go over where we were with our service. We, and we switched to charter, we entered with an initial two year contract, which has since expired, and we've been on a month to month agreement, which I've been comfortable with. Um, we're not tied into anything long term. Uh, and she, obviously, as a sales rep, encouraged us to enter into another multi year deal. And uh, she presented a two and three year option for us. Uh, the three year option presented was the only one that had a pricing advantage to make a change. And I'm kind of sensitive due to the whole AT&T issue getting into long term contract and getting uh, tied into bad pricing down the road and you know, told her I wasn't interested in the three year deal. And she came back with a significantly better pricing on doing a two year deal, which I think is a pretty acceptable, pretty safe time frame. Um, for our internet service for WAPAC online, our price would be reduced $300 a month on this new contract. And for the City Hall Library building phone service, our monthly expense would be uh, reduced by $25. So I, I recommendation for me is to enter into a two-year deal at these better rates and save some money. Any questions? Um. I'm concerned about the band, total bandwidth we have at 70 megabytes. We've had that for several years now. Are, are, we, are we close to maxing out on that? I anticipate probably late summer we'll be looking to bump that up. We're not quite there, but we're pretty close. And one of the nice things with the charter is they're, when we met with them, they know our whole AT&T situation. And um, if we need to go up or down in speed at any time, they'll allow us to do that. For additional charge. Yeah, we'd pay more per month if we bump up to more speed, but it's uh, uh, on the old contract, it was $10 per meg. So if we bumped up another 10 meg, that would add $100 to the contract. And I asked the sales rep, you know, I anticipate late summer we'll probably bump up to 80 at least. And, you know, due to the new contracts, you said we just submit to her and they'd work out a new agreement on that. So that's what the, that's what the new rate would be? Uh, um Ten dollars per. Megabyte. No, she couldn't guarantee that we'd go to her, tell her the speed, and she'd come back with a updated amount. Oh. But since we're out of that initial contract, that uh, ten dollars per meg isn't there anymore either. But can, can we work that into this new contract if it's a two-year agreement? I can ask and see if she can define a rate to build into this. I can ask that. Yeah. Well, especially since you think it's going to be so short-term, I would think. Uh, It'd be nice to know what that is. Yeah, I can go back to her and request that. That's not a problem. And there's no time rush to sign this new agreement. We can just stay month to month. Um, I just suspect if we wait too long, if this gets dragged out too long, that this pricing that she gave us may change. But I don't see any issue waiting another two weeks to bring something back. The other question I have, Josh, is are there any other uh, options besides Charter? AT&T. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh Lord. So there is no other option. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This um, is pretty nice pricing. You know, getting it reduced by three hundred bucks a month is uh, you know, you a good know, spot to be for what we're getting. I'm surprised it's not more of a reduction than that. When we went from AT and T to Charter, we, it was a massive reduction, and this is a slight reduction. I'm surprised at the timeline. That given that we this has been over two years, I'm surprised that we don't get a whole lot more bandwidth for a whole lot less price as we did before. Um, but possibly Charter knows that our only other option is AT&T, which we're not going to take. So that affects their offer. You're Correct. reading my mind, Paul. I was just about <laughs> to say the exact same thing. I mean, is it, I mean, is it possible to go back to them and say, um, you know, we want, well, we'll give you $1,700 a month, but we want that 80 meg right now for that price. I can try. You know, and, you might be you might be surprised at their response. 
if, because they they really want you to sign that two year agreement. Yeah. And if you say yes, we'll do that, but you need to do this because that city council is cheap, then <laughs> you know, they may do it. Well, and also get that additional per meg. That you, yeah. In addition to yeah. Eddie, you get that worked into. Yeah. <clears throat> I can go back to her and with this feedback and see what it does and see if we can get something better worked out. Uh, the other comment I made, she forgot to include our static. We've got two blocks of static IP addresses that are $100 a month each, and she forgot to include that in this initial contract. Went back to her, said, hey, these are missing. I'll make sure this is correct for my for presenting it and you know, reduce that bandwidth from 17 to 1500 Add those two blocks on for 200 more. So you know, I, think I can try. I'll go back and try, but you know, I think they were fair with the pricing but you know it doesn't hurt to ask again and on the phone side don't we don't we really do have more options um, at $25 a month seems to be a little light on uh, a savings we were with 1810 phone we switched to charter who we met with uh, who did we meet with a couple of years ago when we were evaluating this we met with another company for I'd have to go back and look but there was a Another choice for that. I can. I've got that info somewhere. I can look that up. And it would just seem. It would just seem like it. There might be more savings out there than twenty. More than twenty-five bucks a month. How many lines again was that, Josh? Um, it's just a PRI and fiber. I think it's the equivalent of. I think you can have twenty-three phone calls going on at once and we've got a hundred uh, hundred phone numbers that I can route to different extensions so 23 equivalent to 23 lines coming in and that includes a uh, thousand minutes of long distance per month I think it's a pretty good deal Paul but you can ask for more if you want I would do that <laughs> I, I don't have I don't have a lot of other vendors to pit against each other on this. I ran into good luck on the uh, cell phone plan and the copiers we replaced when I had two, three companies to go against each other. But with AT&T being the other big choice, it's kind of hard to pit a couple against each other to drive the pricing down. Well, you know, maybe if you come back in a couple of weeks, and maybe, who knows? At least it's worth asking. Yeah. yeah. I can reach out to her and bring it back at the next meeting and see what we come up with. Yeah. Okay, so are we holding off on this then until we find out? Yeah? All right, got to come back next week from behind the camera for next month. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, the 2015-2016 farmer market request for a sustainable community initiative. Uh, Bonnie is here tonight, Bonnie Miller. Bonnie, thanks for uh, waiting through this process. I get, would this you just give your... Trout, by the way. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Olivia. Go ahead. Um, I guess basically we just want to do the same thing we have been doing with a couple of exceptions, which I noted in the proposal. Um, and... Uh, we also are curious about the possibility of trying setting up on the lawn instead of out in the parking spaces. We've had a lot of trouble with uh, clearing those parking spaces whoops, early enough in the day to, uh, to accommodate all the vendors. And it appears that Gretchen's is more and more successful all the time. Those parking spaces fill up very early. Um, so we just throwing that out there if we could try it and see how that works. <coughs> then those parking spaces would continue to be open for customers and um, you'd have a nice uniform look so you're actually asking that it that you'd be able to set up right on the lawn right on the lawn right okay and then what would you do with your vehicles then we would offload at the sidewalk and then and then move our vehicles Okay. So we wouldn't be selling off of the vehicles, except for um, Fulton Street. on Fulton Street. Everyone that has to sell out of their truck then okay. would be on Fulton well, Street. Let me, let me ask you this too, Bonnie. Sure. What if, uh, I mean, that's a pretty wide sidewalk, and maybe this would be a question for the chief along with this, but 
Could you just set up on the sidewalk? I, we need to have a four foot walkway, I believe, for uh, pedestrians. Yeah, we we I might don't... have problems with yeah, not, not having enough room to on the walkway. A lot of the tents are 10 feet deep. Um, Unless we could set up partially on the lawn, that way we'd have, we could still leave the four feet closer mm -hmm. to the highway, to the, to the road, to Main Street. Well, firstly, I like the idea of, of setting up, not in the trucks, but uh, either on the sidewalk or on the, on the lawn. Mm -hmm. My only concern, of course, about the lawn is, is the, is the wear and tear on the lawn. Right. Uh, although it's just once a week, basically. It right? is just a once a week, and we don't uh, obviously drive any stakes or anything. It's all, you know, we have weights for the tents that hold them. Yeah. So, what do you think, Council? Well, your other request, too, I'm sorry, the, your other request, too, was on, what was it the, the weekend of Strawberry Fest that oh, you right. would use? Oh, yes. You want to just explain that a little bit? Uh, we talked to, uh, well, obviously you had a request earlier for closing off everything on Strawberry Fest, which leaves the farmer's market out. So we talked to uh, Chuck McDaniel down at Rural Insurance, and he would he would say it was fine for us to move down there for that day. And uh, so we need your permission, because he says you own that place. So we, you know, as far as he's concerned, it's fine. So you would be setting up on the city's portion of that property, or both ours and in his? A, in a sidewalk or parking lot there, yes. So it would be not just the city's parking lot, but also the parking lot that that C and D Rural Insurance yes. rents from the city. And that would be on a Saturday, and there, there was no one there on Saturday. So okay. Uh, yeah. And then we were also wondering if we we're going to do that, if we could put a banner up there between there and the, the the car lot right there to advertise the farmer's market for that i mean how, uh, how we far were, in advance if, would for you that, that day but also if we could leave it there all the whole summer i don't know that's up to you um but that's it's quite visible there and uh we kind of were looking for advertising places to advertise and it's all right with rural well, I think the day of is, is okay, but Brennan, I defer to you here. <laughs> I would agree with you, Mayor, on the day of, that's okay. Um, as for whether or not the city regulates temporary banners, I believe that, that would be a great area, but we have continuously enforced over the last couple of years that any signs that are off premise are not are prohibited within the city. But we still have a challenge to that with other signs in the community. We have the banner, you know, years ago the city implemented out near the interchange and some of the other gateways into the city to try to alleviate this problem of the banners all across the city to have uniform areas where people can actually put a banner up. And I believe that's actually run through the highway department. They have to talk to Roger to put those banners up. Those were the designated locations for banners of this type to be installed throughout the city to try to minimize some of the clutter that was occurring throughout the community. Roger. I got another question. There. Oh, hold on a second. Let me let Roger. Okay. The banners on a gateway into the city are for nonprofit. They don't allow any for profit to put their banners on them. So they so wouldn't be allowed to, to do well, this. This would anyways. be a profit, though. Yeah. So they wouldn't be allowed on them banner posts. Okay. The organization is actually a nonprofit organization that represents um, a larger. Yeah, uh, a for profit group. Yeah. <laughs> Among yeah. other things, yeah, the farm market is part of our initiative. Well, I guess what Roger's saying is, is that's not why we put up those sure. those posts is is for something like this. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly want to be able to accommodate you on the well. We, let, me, let me ask fast. you once more another question. You, you've got the fence out there by the recycling center, and I think that would be another great place for for a banner, permanent banner for the summer, and. Uh, Am I going to run into the same roadblock there? That's the commission. Yeah, it, I mean, the city doesn't alone. Uh, the city has one vote on that property, so you would have to request that from the... Exactly. But it's also within the city, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're back to the same situation. Yeah. 
So that's a no. Kind of sounds like it. Okay. Well, that's what we're looking at. We want to know what, what we can do and what we can't do. And obviously, we want to do what's right, but we also <laughs> want to promote us. And I've been asked to go to about four other cities, and those cities promote the farm markets. There. There the city, the chamber does. There the, the council does. You know, all of those. So I'm just putting that out there. So you're saying that we're not promoting you? Is I that didn't what you're... say that. <laughs> Then why'd you, bring, why'd you bring it up? It, it, why did you bring it up in if you're not other, saying we're not promoting you? In several other cities, they put up the banners for us in those places. That is why I said it. And otherwise... You bring back what the other cities do, and we'll take a look at it. Okay. I'll do that. I can I could tell you now, but I, I, I'll i bring it back. You bring back what their ordinances say that allow them to do okay. that, and we'll take a look at it. I don't know we'll what their ordinance says, but that's what they do. Okay. But we're back to the uh, Strawberry Fest then and uh, setting up at Rural. Is that, is that uh, we need a vote on that? Is there, during Strawberry Fest, isn't there another, like a church group that always uses that parking lot during Strawberry Fest? I thought that they used the no property that was down by where Shamble was, uh, where the Edward Jones is across from the post office, or am I wrong? I'm sorry. I, no, I, I don't know. I just remember them coming forward. I don't know if it was the last two years or maybe it was just last year. Okay. I don't think we've gotten a request from anybody else to use the city property across from Quick Trip that you know of. Okay. I don't know. You just suspended the market last year? For Strawberry Fest? We did, yes. There were some of the vendors, individual vendors, that uh, that set up, and we did get uh, permission through the chamber to um, to set up on one of the side streets, but very few of the vendors took advantage of that. There's, um, It's not really the kind of market where um, the average person that's there for the Strawberry Fest isn't prepared to carry around three pounds of hamburger and a dozen years of corn for a couple hours. But it, uh, we're mostly looking at having a venue where our regular customers can still come and get at us fairly easily and, and, uh, and maybe enjoy Strawberry Fest, too, if they want to. So we just want to kind of conduct regular business off to the side a little bit. Mayor Henry, for some odd reason, I'm f vaguely remembering, I think the chamber actually is in that parking lot last year for one of their vendors during Strawberry Fest. I thought there was a request that came forward. It's too bad Mitch left already. But I, I, I don't remember. But I, I actually thought that there was a request brought forward last year. So I'm going to use it. I'm not sure it was Strawberry Fest. I agree, but I can't remember the date either. <coughs> Would it be better? Baptist Church. They do a fundraiser selling funnel cakes. I think that's uh -huh. what it is. I parked there last year. That's why I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was a one-time thing or if they've always done that. I well, let's let's do this, okay? Okay. First of all, let's let's talk about. Uh, are we okay? And we would need a motion. Then, are we okay with allowing the the uh, farmers market to use the lawn um, instead of uh, just parking on the street? I, think I would. Could. I guess what I would prefer is to have the combination where there's part on the sidewalk and, the, and part on the lawn rather than the whole lawn. You know, that would make more sense, I would think, than just to would, open up the whole lawn. It would reduce any anywhere that there is. It would minimize so it. That's what I would think would be best. Okay. Can so they could do either or? Is that what you're saying, Paul? No, I would, I would think I would restrict them to being partially on the sidewalk, leaving a forefoot for pedestrian okay. traffic, and then, then the back end of their booths or whatever is most appropriate. Um, being on the lawn, so they could encroach on the lawn, but wouldn't be on the whole rest of the other part of the lawn. But they would not be on the street. They would not be on the street. On Main Street. That's right. correct. I mean, they're still going to be on East Fulton Street. Yes. Dave. I was going to say about the same thing. If they kept their sales stands so the people walk on the sidewalk and they're not on the grass, only ones on the grass would actually be the sellers. Good point, yeah. You okay. know, if you could set up tights, you just limit the 
traffic that way. Okay. Brent. I do want to double check. I don't, I think four feet is incorrect. I think it's either, if we're talking Main Street, I think because that is a wider sidewalk, we're, I think in the uninstructed uninst area is actually six feet, but I would have to double check the ordinance. We have that in place on Main Street specifically. Okay. So just whatever it is, we just, you know, four feet or six, we'll just have to get so that if clarified. We, if we okay this, we're approving whatever the city allow or is requiring, right? Yes. So if they have to move more onto the lawn to make that re to In follow that requirement with our ordinances. Okay. Anybody want to make that in the form of a motion? Since I brought it up, I would be happy. <laughs> I'll second it. A motion by Hagen, second by Peterson, that we approve of the farmers market uh, using the sidewalk and uh, city square lawn to uh, set up uh, uh, their their booths uh, instead of using uh, Main Street uh, for that. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, uh, Strawberry Fest. Uh, what are your thoughts? Council on uh, allowing them to set up on the, the city portion of it. I, I'm assuming that they got permission from uh, C&D, Chuck McDaniel Royal Insurance, so they could just stay on the, the part that they rent from, the, that C&D rents from the city, and, and they would be okay with that. Um, but they're asking that they also use the city parking lot part of that also. I, I'm not certain how much of that is the city's and how much is the yeah. insurance what is uh, where's the where is it i think the easiest way line. to go ahead roger it's the west side of the building the parking lot straight out from the building okay west side going toward or south franklin street is the city's the rest of the lot is uh, rented rural insurance so going back up towards main street then is is all the insurance company correct well, that's plenty of space for us. So that's all you're requesting? Sure. Then you yeah. don't need anything from us. Yes, uh, well, you own the property. He, uh, it was he just rents a, it? He, was, it was, he suggested that we talk to you. Yeah. You don't need our permission. Okay. You need his permission. Okay. He's the one that has to be liable for you being on that property. Make sure that you have proof of insurance. I think he knows that. He's an insurance agent. Yeah. You don't need <laughs> our But you don't need our approval. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Wonderful. All right, anything else? I had no. one more. Now, yeah, go ahead. In regards to the banner on the day of the event, is, is it going to be over the street? Where's the banner going to be? Oh, no, it's, we just have these, like, eight, are they eight feet? Yeah, uh, eight feet wide banners. and uh, 30 inches deep. Okay, and that's yeah. going to be on the property, on the property where you're at? Probably. Okay. All right. Okay, okay. good luck. Thank you very much. Right, Thanks. All right, let's move on. Uh, license report number 1274. This is a Class A beer and intoxicating liquor license for Quick Trip Incorporated. Um, Henry, anything yeah. unusual about no, this? No, we do have a representative of Quick Trip. Uh, I, I'm assuming you're Brenda Lee. Um, no, I'm actually oh. Carrie Grudy, and I'm her assistant. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> yeah. I think this is to be consistent with your licensing at your downtown store yes. on Fulton. However, you're not selling alcohol, and we under you understand that, but you're still asking for the license. Yes. Okay. And this would be through June 30, uh, and then you would be in a renewal mode. Going forward. Yes. Yeah. I don't get it. You're not, <laughs> you're not selling alcohol, but you want a license? We have beer and malt beverages, but it's in a separate entity of our actual sales floor. We have a separate entrance for it. We have a bell on that door. We have a little bell on the counter, so everything can be, we just jump back and forth from sales floor counter to beer counter. Right. Yeah, but we well, do sell beer. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the the part we don't get is is that why are you asking for an intoxicating liquor license when you're only selling beer? I don't know. Okay. 
Do you have plans to do that? Not that I'm aware of, so I just thought we were renewing our beer license. So are they actually maybe not filling out the correct form? Well, I can tell you Barb had this conversation with, with your man, with your, okay. your uh, uh, boss and explain this fully and they're willing to pay the money. Um, I, I guess they're, they're wanting options. Um, and this was the license they applied for for your downtown store. So this is consistent with what you have at the downtown store. So, I mean, they're making the request. It's a viable request. It, it is pending background checks and everything. So I think we're bringing it forward because they applied and they want it. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure what they plan on bringing in. And this, or is, if they're this is just for from now until through June 30th, Henry, or this is yeah for next year? Because the license period goes to to June 30th. So, yeah, they would. It says uh, 2016. Does it? It says 2016. Yeah. So it would start on June. July 1st. Oh, right. I'm sorry. This is separate from the, the mass ones. Oh, okay. Right, right. Okay. So this would start on July 1st of 2015 and run through June yeah. 30th of 2016, okay. and they just want the option of being able to sell liquor. Well, some of our some of our stores do sell liquor. Um, we are just a store that just sells beer and malt beverages right now. Currently, not sure what their plan is in the next year, but Chief, any issues here? <laughs> I guess new territory. They're applying for a license they don't intend to sell. I don't. <laughs> doesn't really but that doesn't mean they can't sell. Right. I mean, once they get the license, they can do it. Any, you know. Well, I guess my question is, is that if they do decide to put liquor in there, they can go ahead and do that. If we okay that, do we have an issue? I mean, they do have a separate entrance. Uh, people can't get from the convenience store to the to the liquor store. I think that follows all of the mm -hmm. rules that we have. So they certainly could do that. I don't know why they wouldn't be able I, that's why I asked. John Hart, what do you think? <clears throat> Initially they just applied for a beer license and we changed the ordinance concerning having that separate entrance but a contiguous uh, counter so that they could service both sides of it and I don't see anything wrong with this as far as there is no restriction on the number of Class A alcohol licenses in the city, as I'm aware of. Great. So, if, if there's no reason not to. Okay. <coughs> what is the fee for this? Is it $600 also, Henry? $600. Yeah. Yes, sure. Mayor, I'd move for approval. Okay. Second. Motion by mail, second by Prochatsky, that we approve of license report number 1274, Class A Beer and Intoxicating Liquor License for Quick Trip Incorporated. Any discussion? Well, then there's nothing wrong with them. If we do this, they can have alcohol or liquor at any time. They can. July 1st. Yeah, Brennan? Is that at both their locations, or are we just speaking in the downtown? I don't remember that the QQ store actually has beer out there. They do. I am actually up at the QQ store. Oh. I'm not representing downtown they do. right now, but it's the same. We have the same exact setup. We sell right. the same exact oh, I missed it. Yeah, they do. Okay. All right, any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Uh, next, we have license report number 1275. This is a Class B intoxicating liquor license and Class B fermented malt beverages and class A beer and intoxicating liquor license and class B fermented malt beverage license and class C wine license. Basically these are for um, bar owners and uh, the other liquor stores in town here. You'll see a list of the ones that have already applied. I, I talked to Barb today. There are a couple that we'll see again in, in the June meeting. Um, these all have to be okayed uh, prior to June 30th, uh, because that's when July 1st is when the licenses uh, go from July 1st through June 30th. Unless there's anything that is a concern of anybody, I, we'd be looking for a motion. Make a motion, we approve. License number 1275. Second. 
I have a motion by Hackett, second by Keelan, that we approve license report number 1275. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Uh, Mayor, I abstain. I'm one of the bar owners. Okay. So am I, but I'm not voting. Okay. <laughs> so we had uh, eight ayes, no noes, one abstention. Okay. Next, we have uh, license report number 1276. This is an arcade amusement device license. Again, you can see the list of the names that are in there. There will be a couple of stragglers that you'll see in the next month's um, agenda. In the category of banging my head against the wall, um, I, I asked, I've asked this in the past, um, why do we have to approve gambling machines in the city? And I'll direct that to you. I don't know if they're not legal. <laughs> they're investigated by the state. If they have less than five is under the jurisdiction of the state, so we don't have any authority to regulate them locally because the way the statute is now written. That was changed a few years ago to take it out of our hands. Okay. So that's why all of these are five or less basically yep yes over five is a felony under five is a forfeiture and you know only enforcement action that can be taken is by state authorities and they choose not to they're they're overwhelmed right but technically they are not legal but we can't do anything about it <laughs> uh, correct I don't know about the licensing part of it but we cannot enforce the gaming laws under that only the state can do we have the ability to not license the gambling devices if we so choose? I would have to go to Attorney Hart. And I would pose that question to him. This would also cover pinball machines, jukeboxes. I think the arcade license does have to do with dancing and various other things things that they do in those establishments, Pool not tables. just necessarily gambling machines. So you're approving various other things besides those machines. So all of those devices you mentioned are under the gambling machines license? They're under amusement device license. Uh, this is not a gambling machine license. This is just amusement device. It, it, it says right on the... It the says how many gambling machines they have. For instance, Nelson Strike Drone has four gambling machines and ten others, which means they have pinball machines or whatever okay. else. And that's what we're regulating. It just so happens that the Department of... I don't know if it's the Treasury or whatever, are the only... The only enforcement commission that can do anything about gambling machines, if it's five or less, we can't do anything about it. So there really isn't any discussion about whether we do it or don't do it. They're theoretically illegal under the statute, but the that statute does provide that municipalities cannot enforce it. We can enforce situations where there's more than five machines. Are we compelled to, to issue the licenses for these gambling machines? I don't know that you're issuing licenses for gambling machines. You're issuing a license to provide them with the ability to have amusement devices and arcades. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. <coughs> Anybody else? Motion? I move to approve license report 1276. Second. A motion by Dave Peterson, second by Prochatsky, that we approve of license report number 1276, which is an arcade amusement device license. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Next, we have uh, license report number 1277, which is the operator's license. 
Again, you can see a list of uh, all the people that have applied so far. You'll probably see a few in June that uh, didn't quite make the deadline, and we'll have to get their license uh, 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 oaked, uh, taken care of it. in the June meetings. Uh, there are some requirements uh, that, of these operators, and you can see that uh, they're pending some checks and, and also that they do not owe the city any money before they can actually receive their license. Move to approve license number 1277 pending background checks and any fines owed to the city. Second. Motion by Hagen, second by Keelan that we approve of license report number 1277, operator's license. Any discussion? Mayor, just for information, Barb did say there's just two or three that we'll have to collect some outstanding fines on. So that's really pretty great compliance given how many we have. Probably all belong to the back of All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Ma Motion carried. Mayor, I abstain on that Oh, one. I'm sorry. We have a, one abstention again. My wife's an operator. Eight ayes, zero <laughs> noes, one abstention. All right. Uh, let's uh, move on then. <coughs> Kathy, you're back up again. This is approval of a change in employee benefits broker. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this spring, uh, we were notified by our current employee benefit broker, M3, that um, Vicki was uh, retiring, and we thought that this would be a good time to see what other employee benefit brokerage firms uh, could bring to the city, especially with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, tonight, I have uh, Rayanne Beaudry from the Horton Group, which is the... Um, Employee Health Insurance Committee's recommendation. They we did in, interview four firms. Um, we had M3 come back, uh, the Horton Group, Ansan Associates, and Willison Associates, and it was the decision of the group to uh, go with the Horton Group. <coughs> Ray, anyone? Uh... Sure, um, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you so much for having us and for inviting us to respond to your request for proposal. I sent some information along for your packets that talked about a little bit about the Horton Group and myself and the team. And I just wanted to say we're looking forward to hitting the ground running on June 1st. Um, I know that's a worn out phrase, but we've actually started to work with some of the city's vendors to get some information so that when we um, are on board officially on June 1, we can start talking with WA Insurance Trust, make sure that we have the most lucrative renewal in the most um, efficient manner and very, very quickly. We also wanted to ask them to do some adjustments with um, renewal scheduling to ask for a 15-month rate guarantee to get the city out of the community rating for another year, um, to just be more in compliance with the Affordable Care Act and get the best possible rate. Also, that would bring us to a potential of a 1-1 renewal date. The city has asked us to explore the possibility of a high deductible health plan that would also be compatible with a health savings account. Those are best done on a calendar year for tax purposes and filings and all of those kinds of reporting things. So we're quickly working with that. On behalf of the employees, we have put together a team sheet that will go out. Um, we've asked uh, Kathy and Tina to make that available to every employee and retiree here so that they have direct phone lines and email addresses to each of their team members so that if people have a claim question, they have some things that they cannot get resolved with any of the carriers that we're working with on their behalf, that they have an advocate in our office and that we're there to do that right away. The last and most important thing is we will be helping the city with all their filings and their reporting filings under the um, Affordable Care Act up to and including the new 10094s and the 10095. Uh, 10 so we're uh, all ready for the IRS compliance testing and we're ready to go. So thank you again for having us and we would um, be very honored to enjoy a working relationship with the city of Wapaka. Uh, Couple questions. I, it was just a few years ago that Henry, we switched from a calendar year plan to a fiscal year plan. So, a couple questions there. Number one, are we going to have the numbers in place so that we have a, a good concrete number for our budget? And two, is this going to cost us more money now to go back to a calendar year versus a fiscal year health plan? Well, that question got asked uh, during the interview, so I'll let Ray Ann 
respond? It did. Um, I have been working in the employee benefits field for the last 31 years of my career and the last 20 specifically in the public entity niche. So the vendors that I work with, including your incumbent as well as the carriers that would propose to work with the city of Wapaka, know that I need my renewal numbers um, 120 days out. So even if we change, we will have our renewal on or about September 10th. Every year I do a block underwriting call with those vendors. So if we were to move back to a calendar year, we would have our renewal numbers in place without without question. So they know that that's an expectation. Secondarily though, with some of the things the city has wanted to explore, considering a high deductible health plan and an HSA, you have your flexible spending accounts are on a little bit different year. So we would have to line that up and sync it up or we wouldn't enjoy some of the tax advantages and employees would be somewhat confused and probably a little bit disadvantaged in their personal relationships with those types of accounts. So we would work very, very hard to make sure we had a strategic plan to do the education, but that yes, we would have those renewal rates. I'm expecting, I'm anticipating that we will know your renewal for 10-1, whether it's for 12 months or 15 months by no later than the middle of July. So we're not looking at a three month renewal where we're looking at a 15 month renewal. Correct. It would be a one one seventeen strategy if we were going to move to that to that decision. Okay, and we don't have a high deductible health plan right now? We do. <laughs> you have a high deductible health plan, Mr. Mayor, but you don't have one that's what's called HSA compatible. So there are still some first dollar benefits that are available under those plans that you're enjoying. And don't we contribute to an HSA for our employees, some of the employees? You contribute to a health reimbursement account. It's sli it's a slightly different funding mechanism. Okay. Okay. And you're talking about going from an HSA or an HRA to an HSA? It was, was it, definitely something we wanted to explore. Those were some some of the proposals, uh, some of the questions that the employee health insurance committee members had asked um, during the interview process. Um, we also um, explored the possibility of self insurance. So part of the, um, the process is going to be with this um, we a trust renewal is really just to get us off of the community rating um, timeline so that instead of looking at us um, for renewals as um, based on our experience, the community rating is going to base us on our, where we are physically. So what our health healthcare costs are for our location. So instead of knowing that I've got five or six people that um, may have heart transplants, uh, isn't going to be the, the driving force to the premium costs. So by going on to this 15 month uh, renewal, we'll avoid uh, getting a community rating for at least another year, be able to explore whether we need to change into uh, the high deductible uh, HSA instead of a HRA and um, possibility of self-insurance so or even a hybrid model of that so just some of the cost um, uh, analysis that we need to do on our health insurance policy for the employees uh, and for our costs uh, is just part of the explore exploration but the 15 month will just buy us some time and if we go with going for that renewal okay so we do understand, though, that we do not fully fund the HRA, and if we go to an HSA, we're going to have to fully fund those for each one of the employees if we decide to do that. Right. We but do understand that, that we have cost savings in the HRA where we won't have those in the HSA. Right. But it was just it was one of those questions that had come through. This isn't what we're, we're proposing at all. It's just one of those things that we're looking at as costs. And, and, and options. So it, w it wasn't anything that this was going to be what we're going to go for for a renewal from We a Trust. What we're looking at is just getting our renewal right now for what we have in place. There also are new rules under um, health savings account funding mechanisms, Mr. Mayor, where you can do a monthly um, contribution. You can do it quarterly as long as the employee knows how much the employer entity is going to be contributing on their behalf so they don't go over. A certain dollar amount there are different methodologies to fund those vehicles now that are allowed under the IRS code okay I have a couple questions go ahead um, Kathy what was it about um, what was it about 
this particular group that the committee found excelled over the other ones? I think it was the fact that the team members um, were uh, present and uh, that they were uh, looking at uh, different um, um, proposals that going in the Horton group was the only one that said about doing a 15 month renewal and for uh, getting away from the required community ratings where we may get a, a higher increase prior to that time and be able to change um, and look at the policy giving more time to do that if we didn't do that we would probably be under the community's rating for Your 2016 title. so now we've just pushed it off for another year so it, it'll help in um, in in reducing any increase in the premium costs shared by the employees so we just bought some time is what we've done to be able to uh, look at other ang uh, avenues. Um, Willis was the other uh, um, group that uh, the committee liked, um, but the, um, the committee felt that the Horton group was uh, known in that I've worked with the Horton group for 14 years in my previous employers. Um, the, Horton group uh, for the village of Greendale when the, we, they went to market saved the um, village four hundred and forty thousand dollars on a change in their health insurance premium when they went off the state plan so I think um, my experience uh, that it is a known that Horton's been able to deliver uh, in the past to uh, uh, um, knowing how the impacts to the to the municipalities cost and to the employees cost and being a accessible um, ha was the reason why they recommended Horton because Willis was unknown uh, and say and uh, m3 um, the committee felt that the uh, proposals the presentation and their proposals uh, were not up to par with uh, the ones that from Horton or Willis Paul as a committee member I can tell you they they want they want our business their presentation was far superior um, and they brought all their team members everybody that's listed here came to that meeting so I that, that made a big impression on us where some of the others I mean they, they it just wasn't as polished and, and, and they put a lot of effort into into the into their presentation and, and my second question, and, and, and please excuse my ignorance, but how how does the Horton Group get compensated for the services that they provide the city? Um, currently, the proposed uh, rule under the, with the city of Wapaka is we would be taking over at this point in time the commission level that is built in for M3 that M3 was receiving. So the carriers are currently paying the freight through commission. That can be changed upon renewal, and we can take the commission out, and the city can pay directly. It's a it's a consulting fee or or arrangement if the city would choose to do that. So we we are going um, the one thing at renewal. There have been a couple of questions about what that level commission is. The typical standard commission that we receive from WEA as your incumbent health health insurance carrier, for example, is one and a half percent. There was some discussion at the committee meeting. Um, that M3 may have been receiving more than that. Horton never takes more than standard. That is that is our philosophy, and that is um, the direction of my corporate office, which unfortunately or fortunately is in Orland Park, Illinois, and Illinois was hit pretty hard under the um, Elliott Spitzer insurance investigation. So we're pretty strict on what we can take as compensation. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Motion? I'd move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion by mail, second by Dave Peterson, that we approve of hiring the Horton Group from Pewaukee, Pewaukee Wisconsin, as the city's employee benefit broker of record. Any discussion? Uh, the only discussion I have, Henry, and, and and Kathy, I would like to actually meet with them if I could. Uh, so if we could set up a time where we could, it can either be by telephone or, or whatever. 
for it. Absolutely. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to get a little more information on it. Thank you. Any other discussion? Sandy will take the roll. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Paul Mayo. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Eric Olson. Jillian Peterson. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. And Alan Keeland. Aye. Eight ayes, one absent. Motion carried. Thank you. Good luck. Uh, Kathy built you up that you're going to save us all this money, so we're looking forward to that. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, I guess we're, we have uh, nothing for issues, projects for discussions, communications, recommendation of the mayor. I have uh, nothing additional tonight. Uh, we do have uh, one item that we need to discuss in closed session, so we're going to close up shop here and, and allow the uh, council to discuss this item in closed session. So we're going to ask people with the motion to go into closed session that anybody that's not on city council um, uh, please uh, remove themselves from the room and we'll close and lock the doors at that time. Uh, as far as uh, staff individuals, Henry, Anybody that we need to? Uh... Well, Kathy and, and Brennan were involved in, in some of these discussions, and then the city attorney. So, I mean, if if you, Chief and Aaron and Roger, if you guys want to, and Peg, if you want it to go, you certainly can. You can certainly stay if you want to, too. That's fine. So we'd need a motion to uh, convene into closed session. So moved. Second. Motion by Keelan, second by Hagen that we convene into closed session in accordance with Wisconsin State Statute Section 19.85, parent E, to deliberate or to negotiate the purchase of public property as it concerns the sale of city-owned land in the business and technology park. Any discussion? If not, uh, Sandy will take the roll. Paul Mayo. Aye. Chuck Whitman. Aye. Dave Peterson. Aye. Paul Hagen. Aye. Steve Hackett. Aye. Scott Prochatsky. Aye. Eric Olson. Aye. Alan Keeland. Aye. And Jillian Peterson. Nine ayes, motion carried. <coughs> Thanks.